bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Yeah, man, how you doing? Today's Monday, March 26th, 2018. 85 days into the new year, just 280 days left. We are live from a bunker. Somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world. All across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? Hold on, I got to get a good evening in here. To the chat room. To the chat room. Yay. Done. All right. Good evening, everybody. How are you? It's Monday. Tonight, very special guest, Jim Vieira is here. He's back. And tonight, we're going to discuss Atlantis and Lemuria. Now, also... If uh, you're going to contact in the desert, Jim is going to be out there uh, presenting this year. Can't wait to hang out with him. And uh, he's got a bunch of different presentations he's doing out of contact in the desert. And one of the things, and I was uh, talking about this uh, with everybody on the bunker cam right before the show. Rita and I, with with Egypt, ancient Egypt, the gods of Egypt, uh, pre-dynastic Egypt, and you start to reach back and you're looking at... At, at Thoth and everything that, I mean, in, in, which includes um, Mesopotamia, uh, the Sumerian tablets, and, you, you know, you got to throw in Sitchin and Edgar Casey and and the Emerald tablets and, and all of, you know, you start to, you know, and you're looking in all these different directions, which Rita and I do constantly, right? We're trying to figure this thing out, just like the rest of you. So, um, and in that... Uh, research and again, so many excellent books and presentations and documentaries. It seems like we've uh, uh, seen them all, right? And you just keep going in other directions, and everything always leads back to. It's really funny. Everything goes back to Lemuria and Atlantis, and for a lot of our community, we get that and we understand that. Um, but there's a lot of us out there that that don't know anything about Lemuria. And Edgar Casey and Thoth and and Atlantis and how all of this ties into all of the other uh, 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 not only um, myths and and legend and stories and documentation and goes which goes to Greece of of course Egypt and how everything kind of ties together and we are constantly Rita and I just falling back onto Lemuria. So Jim Vieira is our guest tonight. We're going to discuss Atlantis and Lemuria, and he is going to be a contact in the desert and uh, this June out in Palm Springs, and he's going to be doing a bunch of presentations on this too as well. And of course, we know Jim from a Giants, right? Giants in America, Hugh Newman, and and his research is second to none, and he understands. Uh, what is going on out there. And so his research is another piece to this puzzle. And I'm very excited to have Jim back on the show tonight to talk about Atlantis and Lemuria. Tomorrow night, right here, David Icke is back joining the show because of uh, all of 
this uh, the Facebook stuff. Apple got involved today over the weekend. Elon Musk dropped his uh, Facebook accounts and and uh, you know, all these articles and all the talk on data harvesting and and censorship and everything that is going on with social media platforms out there. And the Internet in general, there is only one person to talk to about all of this, and that is David Icke. So tomorrow night, we're going to do it, man. We're going to talk about the social media data dump and data harvesting, censorship, all of that. And he's been talking about this forever, and now it's starting to come to pass. So we've got David Icke on the show tomorrow night. Wednesday night, Ed Nightingale is here. Yay. Right? Ed Nightingale um, last last week we had Laird Scranton on, and we were, um, you know, planning on having Ed on. And it's really funny that uh, Ed and Laird are going to be doing uh, this presentation um, up in New York, in Albany, and uh, I think it's Albany. And we're going to talk about that on Wednesday night. But everything else I just mentioned, Lemaria, right, and and Jim Vieira, and and how everything is connected. Ed Nightingale and his work and uh, the Giza template, um, again, everything is connected, right? It, it really is. And you start to get into sacred geometry and numbers and 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 layout. Um, the way that Giza um, has been constructed and and laid out is it's uh, it's it's beyond coincidence when it comes to numbers. Now, check this out. Now we've got this new chamber right above the Grand Gallery. And Ed's research into this and how it fits into his numbers and the Giza template, it's t- it's time to blow some minds. So we're going to do that on Wednesday night. What a great week. Uh, Thursday night's Fader Night. John Rappaport's going to be here, open lines. Friday night, I'm over at Coast. And yeah, yeah, I know. I said I was on Coast last week. It was my bad, and I didn't. Uh, my calendar and my brain said I was on coast last week. I'm on coast this week and next week. This week on Friday, my guest is Matthew Ryan, followed by Open Lines. And Saturday night on coast, also two first-time guests over on coast, uh, Matthew Ryan and Emery Smith will be my guest for the full evening on Saturday over at coast. So there you go, full week. Fade to black, coast to coast, no rest for the wicked. Uh, It's going to be a great week. Come and hang out with us. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Simple at J Church Radio. Hashtag F two B is the sandbox. Hashtag F two B Q is fade to black questions on Twitter. Just hashtag me right there. I'll see you during the show. Any questions or comments, you can also email Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio dot com. Um, I got some breaking news here, and this started last week. There has been a few articles that have been posted. I've looked at the images. Um, it has been revealed that concrete has been poured on Gobekli Tepe. Yeah. Yeah, there should be some outrage here. It is a UNESCO World Heritage listed site uh, dating now to 12,000 years ago. And from what I can see in the images that have been sent to me is that they are replacing the wooden walkway with a permanent concrete sidewalk. Crazy. I know, right? Temporary wooden sidewalk makes sense. This is an archaeological site, the most important site on planet Earth. But uh, they're replacing that with concrete. Reports are that there are no archaeologists on the site. There's no archaeologists. There, there is just workers there pouring concrete wherever. Totally nuts, man. Klaus Schmidt right now is turning over and over and over in his grave. Man, it's 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 unbelievable. So um, now, look, there's a lot of uh, it's not exactly the most stable area on planet Earth. Getting to the site and and getting images and video and trying to find out what's uh, what's going on there. We know what's going on, but trying to get the word out, it's very difficult to do. Um, but, uh, Graham Hancock just posted some stuff on this and, uh, just it's, it's, it's an outrage, but there's not, it's, you know, it's Turkey. It's on the Syrian border. There's nothing that can be done. And as it turns out, it appears that there's no supervision either. All right. Uh, we are two days in like 15 hours, 16 hours for on stellar, the ICO 
Two hours, or two days, 11 hours, 49 minutes, 36, 35, 34, 33 seconds from the initial ICO. The pre-sale, which went down last week, uh, sold out in a mere seconds. Um, So this is the initial uh, public offering, the initial ICO, which is uh, going down to kick off at midnight on uh, Wednesday night. It's actually scheduled for Thursday, even though this says two days, 11 hours. Okay, so there you go. If you want to jump in, that's up to you. You can go and do that. But you can certainly register now for OnStellar. When you sign on to OnStellar.com, you'll see an orange window. It's an orange button. says register. Click on that. Then there's uh, you can go in a couple of different ways. The, um, the basic thing here, and especially with Facebook and what is going on, all you're doing here is your email and a password and getting registered for the site, which will allow you to secure your screen name so nobody steals your screen name. You can go and do that now. With the uh, registrations that we have for the site, it will allow us to keep in touch with you and let you know when the testing phase is going to kick off, which, which uh, should be in a few weeks, and you can participate in that. And, uh, and then once we get through the testing phase, we, we launch this thing. Um, which um, we've got it posted up on the site that it's quarter four. Those are conservative numbers. I'm here to tell you right now, I'm cracking the whip. I want this thing launched now. And especially with, uh, ah, there you go, just got busted, not turning off my phone before the show. And uh, (laughs) I don't think that's ever happened before. I've always remembered to turn off my phone before the show. So you can go register right now on Stellar.com. You can use the promo code Jimmy or not. But one of the things is if you use a promo code, and this is one of the reasons why you want to use a promo code, you use a promo code when the site launches, everybody, when the site launches in quarter three, and you go and you formally uh, are on the site and you're, you're establishing yourself and building your page and doing your thing and you're having fun, you're going to be given a wallet at that point, a wallet, your own little crypto wallet. What you do with that wallet is up to you. But you, that wallet, by registering to the site, is going to have 10 tokens in it. 10. 10 tokens just given to you. If you registered with a promo code, you're going to have 25 tokens. 25 just given to you. Use the promo code, people. Promo code Jimmy. After you reg- if you register without a promo code and you go and you're you're flying on the site and somebody goes, Hey man, it's pretty cool, got twenty five tokens, and you're gonna go, I only got ten. Well, that's it. You can't unregister. You're done. <laughs> you're done. What are you going to do? Unregister, get rid of your screen name, and go back and re-register with a promo code? Well, you can do that if you want. Use a promo code. Use Jimmy or anybody else's promo code. Anybody, I don't care. But there you go. You want those tokens, okay? And 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 they're free. They're just going to be given to you. So cool. On Stellar. The platform incorporates everything from all of those popular uh, services. We're setting everything up to make sure that uh, you are happy. Uh, with the mobile version is going to be as incredible as the desktop version. Completely focused on our community. All of it, from UFOs to conspiracy to consciousness, lost history, uh, health and wellness, everything that you can think of for our community, it's all going to be there. All right? It's the next great social platform, and it's based on the blockchain. All right, it's going to reward those that contribute, comment, create, post. Think about that. For the first time in history, our community is is going to be there first. It's absolutely going to be amazing. A token economy for our community on Stellar.com. Promo code Jimmy. All right, uh, the E-City Roadshow is still going up the west coast of the United States. Click on the banners over at jimmychurchradio.com and get their schedule and details. Go hang out with Ashley. It's uh, going on right now. Our next event, I just mentioned it, Contact in the Desert, June 1st through the 4th, 2018, Indian Wells, Palm Springs at the Renaissance Resort and Spa. We have a full weekend of events that we're going to be doing with Fade to Black uh, starting off Friday night. Of course, we're broadcasting Fade to Black live. You're going to want to be there, live studio audience, T-shirt cannon, right 
Okay, so that's going down. That's Friday night. Saturday night, uh, the awards dinner. We're going to be there for that. Uh, the magic show Saturday night. I'm going to go over and, and host that too as well. I'm going to be introducing people all weekend. Also, the uh, 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 closing, um, uh, uh, what's the word that I want to use here? There's two closing events I'm doing on, on Sunday night. One, I'm hosting uh, the UFO panel on Sunday night closing. And then the closing ceremonies themselves, I will be hosting that too uh, with Victoria. So there you go. It's going to be great. Come and hang out with us all weekend. The biggest UFO conference on planet Earth, June 1st through the 4th, 2018. And then right after that, our Soul Tech Gathering at E. Seti Ranch. 300 fader knots are going to gather up at E. Seti Ranch. Tickets and information are right there at soultechgathering.com. Go and register today. I cannot wait for that. And that is August 9th through the 12th. And, of course, we have our podcast, 800 Archive Shows. Click on the banners over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can become a fader knot in our official membership section on the site. Everything that you need to know is right there. Four levels of membership for you, from free to full-on game changer. And there you go. Let's get this show cracking. Lots to do tonight. Happy birthday to today. Are you ready? You probably didn't know this. Are you ready? Steven Tyler is 70 years old. That's that's all I got to say. Steven Tyler is 70 years old. Happy birthday, Stephen. Unbelievable. James Kahn today is 78. Martin Short today is 68. Man, people are getting up there in years. You know, Stephen Tyler, 70. That kind of freaks me out right there. James Kahn, 78. Martin Short, 68. Unbelievable. Our dead guy's birthday today is... Leonard Nimoy. That's right. Spock. 1931 to 2015 died at the age of 83. And that's it. Right? Live long and prosper. Leonard Nimoy. Wow. 1931, 2015. Happy birthday. On this day in history, OTD, it went down. 1997. Heaven's Gate cult members found dead in in Rancho Santa Fe, California. The cult led by Marshall Applewhite, who became convinced that an alien spacecraft was on its way to Earth, hidden from human detection behind the comet Hale Bob. Yeah, there you go. 1997. Seems like yesterday, really. 21 years ago. Wow. Fader fact. Okay, now... I know that um, my fader facts that I present to you every day are, by and large, unbelievable. But they're all vetted, and they are all facts. And you uh, can go and repeat my fader facts, knowing that you heard them from me, and you can feel good that they've been vetted, right? So if somebody calls you on your BS, that's when you whip out the Finsky. Whip out some money, you make the bet, right? That's what you do because you're going to win. Now, here's another one. Check this out. Fader fact. While filming Wizard of Oz, 16-year-old Judy Garland was put on a diet of chicken soup, coffee, and 80 cigarettes a day. (laughs) And that is your fader fact. That's unbelievable right there. Eighty four packs. Four packs a day. Unbelievable. Tonight, very special guest Jim Vieira is here. We're going to talk about Atlantis and Lumeria. Tomorrow night, David Icke is here. We're going to talk about social media data harvesting. Wednesday night, Ed Nightingale is here. The Giza Template 2.0. Thursday night, another fader night, John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live, followed by open lines all night long. Friday night, I'm over at Coast. Saturday night, I'm over at Coast. But tonight, it's all about you and Jim Vieira. Okay, now, over the weekend, this whole uh, Facebook data harvesting uh, in general, right, and Apple uh, today jumped in. 
and said that they are ethical with their information. Right. Okay. Um, I've been talking about this for years. The data harvesting, the selling of your data, that's big, big business today. Well, over the weekend, I downloaded my Facebook data file. All 1.5 gigabytes of it. That's right. Facebook has 1.5 gigabytes on yours truly. What they have on you... You need to find out, and you can do it. Just simply go to the settings for your Facebook, and under the general section, you will see it right there. Download your data, and it's not hard to find. So go and do it. That's all you got to do. Just go to Facebook, boom. When you click download your data, the first thing that pops up is password, confirm, done. Sends you an email. Did you do this? Right? Uh, if you didn't, reply to the email. If not, here we go. And then a few minutes later, you'll get another email. Here it is. It's ready for you to view. You click on that. Boom. Done. Zip file. Download straight straight to your desktop. You open that baby up and, and start looking. Pretty amazing stuff can be found. Some strange things, too. And today I got so angry that I cranked up the white zombie all day long. White zombie, full tilt boogie here. Really, really loud. And uh, funny thing was, man, listening to white zombie, I forgot about my old friend, John Tempesta, and uh, being in the band. I just completely spaced that. I go so far back with zombie that I just, you know, I just kind of forgot about that. But Tempesta and I, back in the day, uh, you know, we we were friends. As a matter of fact, Tempesta needed a new car. Rita, I never told you about this. So Tempesta needed a car. This is like 1995, I'm going to say, 94. And uh, when they were recording Astro Creep. And so I sent John, I might have even gone with him, now that I think about it, to a car dealer to go see a friend of mine, Rubik, and he bought an Explorer. But that that's how far back I go with Zombie. And uh, so anyway, listening to Zombie cranked up out of anger today. And uh, anyway, anyway, <laughs> Zombie has a way of, of, you know, when you're angry, listen to Zombie, it equalizes things out. It's just unbelievable to do. So, I'm going through these files, and when you get the zip file and you and you open it, you, you get a series of folders there. And in that series of folders, um, it, it's pretty weird. There's HTML, there's, uh, I think there's messages, there's posts, there's videos, photos, these folders. You open them up, and it's your life's history right there. And for me, this goes back to uh, 2008. And uh, and it's all there, right? Now, I was pretty cool with um, the uh, the videos. I went through all of the videos. Those were all legit. But then I got to uh, two things that really bothered me. And, and I haven't had a chance yet because there's so much data. There's one and a half gigabytes of stuff there that I haven't gone through everything. And if I would have gone through everything, I would have been more angry. I would have listened to more White Zombie and I wouldn't have been ready for the show tonight. But going back, a couple of things. One, there was a whole full of, a thing of hundreds and hundreds of voicemail messages. Now, none of them I've ever heard before. Yeah. And I'm thinking that they are from some Facebook app that I don't know about. Because I've never heard them. I've certainly never gotten any notices about voicemail messages or or where to listen to them or, or when they were recorded. None of that. And I'm going through these one after another. And some of them are a minute or two minutes or three minutes long. And I've got to take the time to listen to these. And some of them are really creepy, too, by the way. And I don't know where they came from or how somebody had access to a voicemail for me. They all start off, hey, Jimmy, hey, Jimmy, hey, Jimmy. I'm like, what the hell? 
And it's all, there is a lot of them. And I don't know. I've never gotten a notification about a voicemail message. So, and I, and, and, and that goes both ways. I've always had Messenger turned off. I've always had uh, all of my uh, information non-existent um, on Facebook. I've never presented anything. And then there was this, a list of phone numbers. Yeah. Now, I started to look at this list of phone numbers and the names attributed to them, and there was a large chunk of phone numbers there for people that I knew and didn't know, some famous, some not, but that were not in my cell phone, that were not in any email correspondence, any post, anything, any any message, none of that. And I'm thinking to myself, who has access to this? And why are these phone numbers in my data file when they're not on my cell phone? I've, I've never record. I've never, you know, but this is where it gets strange for me. It's ultra creepy. If I was a criminal, if I was a criminal, this is data that I could sell or use. And I'm telling you now, if I was a criminal, <laughs> if I was a criminal out there, I would go to my Facebook data and download it because there is stuff there that you can use. It's all there. Not your data. It's the data collected on others. It's nuts. The list of advertisers that now have your information, it's all right there. And you're like, what? Stuff you don't even remember, right? Uh, companies that have your information, all of this stuff is listed right in a row. You know, and what you like, music, music. There's music listed there that you never probably clicked on. And Facebook is going to say that you did. I don't know how this profiling starts or how they build this background on you, but it's all there. And I'm telling you, the two things that freaked me out the most, and I haven't gone through everything, there's so much of it there, is the list of phone numbers and contacts of people that are, are not, I, 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 you know, and it's like, wow, really? Now, I'm telling you, if you're a criminal, Go and download your data file. There is stuff there for you to use. A lot of it. <laughs> a lot of it. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely crazy. And so with this data harvesting, what what is it that Facebook needs this information for? Well, obviously, they sell it to other advertisers. But if you go to your homepage on Facebook, and I've been talking about this, and it's right there. I'm not going to let this go. We'll talk about this tomorrow night. You go to your Facebook page, and you scroll down. It says right here, did you know? It's right there. Answer a question to help people get to know you. And the question of the day today is, if you could change jobs, what would you like to do instead? What 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 is it with this? That is profiling. And it's right here. And that's going to turn around and go in your data file. Think about that. And there's another question after this, and another question after this, and another question after this. Think about that. It's absolutely nuts. We are so done. I am so done with, with Facebook. We are stuck in the meantime until OnStellar gets launched. With uh, doing this, I am not clicking around. I'm not doing anything on Facebook anymore. I'm going to post show information, and that's it. It takes 90 days to clear your data once you close the account down. 90 days. And they don't even tell you what they erased or what they're keeping. Think about that. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. I'll be right back with our guest, Jim Vieira. Stay with us.
You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Natural Health Solutions with Chris and Ronnie. Hey, Ronnie. How you doing? Great, Chris. Now, you're the CEO of GetTheTea.com, right? Yes, I am. What is GetTheTea.com? I mean, is this tea you buy in a store? Well, no, it's not. Life Change Tea is just that. Life Changing. Life Change Tea is an herbal tea that gently cleanses your body from intruders. What do you mean by intruders? Well, intruders are toxins, chemicals, GMOs, heavy metals, and more. They're in our food, in our water, in our air we breathe. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. And Life Change Tea will help you with removing these, as you say, intruders? That's right, Chris. Are there side effects with this tea? Well, you might lose a little weight. When you clean your colon, you lose weight, you feel better, and you have more energy. Wow. Ronnie, where can people purchase Life Change Tea? Oh, that's easy. Get the tea dot com. That's get the tea, T-E-A dot com. Ronnie, I want to thank you for being on the show. People, don't forget, get the tea, T-E-A dot com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA. The planet. Win big with KGRA this summer. Tickets and hotel accommodations to the biggest conferences. Autographed books and DVDs. Chances to win all-inclusive conference cruises. And private dinners with your favorite KGRA hosts. Click the contest tab at KGRARadio.com for your chance to win big this summer. Your contact for the best alternative talk radio on the planet. KGRARadio.com. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Manson, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What a great week we have here on the show. Uh, tonight, Jim Vieira is here. Tomorrow night, David Icke. Wednesday night, Ed Nightingale. Thursday night, John Rappaport. Friday night, I'm over hosting Coast to Coast. My guest is Matthew Ryan. Saturday night over at Coast to Coast this weekend, my guest is Emery Smith. So just an amazing week lined up. Kicks off tonight with Jim Vieira. Stone Mason, author, explorer, host of the History Channel shows like Search for the Lost Giants, Roanoke, Search for the Lost Colony, and Return to Roanoke, Search the Seven. And he's the co-author of Giants on Record with Hugh Newman, one of our favorites. And Jim has investigated worldwide ancient stone sites, studied global indigenous oral traditions, religious documents, the readings of the great mystics and literature of secret societies to form an alternative theory regarding the origins of civilization. A theory almost in perfect alignment with the readings of Edgar Casey. And tonight, we're going to do all of that. We're going to discuss Atlantis and Lemuria, and I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black our good friend, Jim Vieira. Jim, good evening. How are you? 
I'm doing good. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Thanks for having me. It's always great to hear your voice, man. And the accent just says so much, man. I just just love it so much. But um, I want to start off here. Everybody is familiar with uh, your stuff on History Channel and and Hugh Newman. All great stuff. And we're going to talk about that tonight. But i got to ask the obvious, Jim. Um, How did you get into this? Ooh, um, I've always had um, a fascination with um, ancient mysteries, you know, from early on, probably like you too, you know, watching uh, Leonard Nimoy on search, um, in search of uh, Eric Von Daniken stuff and <clears throat> Sitchin stuff in the 70s really caught my attention. Uh, me personally, I, you know, I've always been a voracious reader, but I, I, I got into the more um, controversial aspects of ancient mysteries when I was studying um, Native American stonework in the eastern half of the United States. And I I found uh, all kinds of um, documented evidence for stone forts and actually like a 55-foot stone mound in Ohio that existed that the colonists took apart and all these fascinating stone constructions. And I live in New England, so I, I, I you know, work with Native American um, elders and, and um, preservationists and, and try to assess what is Native American and what is colonial. And by virtue of just reading through town and county histories, I started to uh, stumble across these bizarre giant skeleton accounts over and over again. And, you know, I talked to anthropologists and archaeologists about it, and they say, oh, this is like, a, that was like folk tales or hoaxes or things like that. And I, I just, um, the further I dug, the more evidence I found, the more academic journals and, and heads of anthropology and archaeology in the United States that said similar things, Smithsonian ethnology reports. So it really grabbed my attention, like, this is the, um, the the kind of mundane description of the stationary objects, you know, like anatomical characteristics and dimensions. This wasn't hoaxes and mastodon bones. So I got drawn in there, and, uh, you know, I've always had an uh, affinity for the Casey material, Edgar Casey, the great mystic. Um, my wife at the time had uh, ulcerative colitis, an extremely uh, bad case of it. We, I basically took her home to die. <laughs> you know, when get long, I don't want to get off topic, but she, she was like bleeding to death with ulcerative colitis. And I um, ended up getting her healed through alternative means, and she didn't have to have her large intestine out. And a lot of that was the case of material, the health readings. They're really effective at, at natural cures. He's the father of holistic medicine. So I've always had a fascination. And then, you know, in the middle of one of his readings, he started talking about Atlantis. And he was like, um, you know, like a Christian, all he, he had an eighth grade education. All he did was read the Bible. He didn't believe in reincarnation. He didn't believe in lost worlds or Atlantis. And it all came through as he tapped into this universal library. So I've always had a fascination with doing a comparative analysis in religion and, and other um, sources of information to piece together the past. Because like you and all your listeners, we hate contradiction and we want a, a, like an understanding of the past without the filter of the human ego uh, and agenda, like distorting it for somebody's theory or, or, or uh, somebody's profession, if you know what I mean. Now, also, what impresses me about you is also the scariest thing about you, which is you, <laughs> you, you're like a pit bull. You don't, I don't think you would, I would want to piss you off. Right. And so once you know what I mean? And and you are not going to give up. And you started to find out that we you know, you've been lied to and your family and your friends and 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 that's it. You're on a quest and you're gonna figure this out and you're not going to give up until you do. Well, yeah, I guess I'm like an obsessive freak, but I'm not like, you know, beating people up in the back alley. I'll say that. You know, like uh but I I, like many people, I think it's funny because one of the things I want to hit on is the collective unconscious, right? The Jungian collective unconscious. Right. You know, the comparative analysis that I talk about, um, you know, Rosicrucians, Freemasons, Edgar Cayce, mystics, uh, biblical sources, you know, on and on and on, oral indigenous traditions. They're all speaking, you know, kind of metaphysically of the a holographic reality that we're all attached to, we're all part of. Right. And that's what um, science is coming around to, to explain, too. You know, this is your, especially your audience understands this concept. So it's like these these concepts, they keep recycling in the, in the, uh, the unconscious mind, you know, generation after generation, you know, Atlantis, 
and giants and the great flood and, and all these themes of a lost world, we just can't get them away from us because they'll literally talk about past and professionals can deride and mock you for bringing these things up, but they're, they're in popular movies. People are enthralled by the idea of a lost world, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings. Uh, it, there's, there's an incredible fascination. You know, just a show like Ancient Aliens uh, is enthralling to people, you know, that it just, like, say it's not like a scientific paper, but the themes, like, a lot of the, the people you have on, a lot of the ancient mysteries researchers, you know, nobody has a time machine, but we're all, I think, hitting these general themes that resonate with people. Like, as improbable as it may occur to a modern-day anthropologist and archaeologist, you know, this idea of a lost world and, and um, the anthropological mysteries like giants and little people and almost the supernatural and the, the Sumerian gods, you know, these things are like literal events that happen on Earth that we have a, a archetypal memory of. So I try to tap into that and to try to set my ego aside. You know, I'd like to say, you know, the, the comparative analysis I do of all these sources isn't like, oh, I'm a big hero, I get a theory. It's like distilling the exact same bizarre and specific information in all these worldwide sources and worldwide cultures that are so, um, like, strikingly similar, it cannot be coincidence. What what is it that the man is so afraid of? I think it's I think it's human nature. I think it's um, you know when you're in power you want to. Uh, this is for everything. You know I'm not even uh, like a strong believer in academic conspiracies. You know there's like real you know like Building Seven and, and you know it's uh, there's a lot of like legitimate conspiracies in the world that, right. that are <laughs> you know just carried out in, in a just just an obscene way but then there's like um you know let me give you an uh, like analogies like when i go to my doctor you know thank god i get um antibiotics you know so my foot doesn't like uh get amputated like a hundred years ago but at the same time my doctor doesn't understand a holistic approach to health right he doesn't say like you know once you do a juice fast or take some spirulina or you know, meditate or do yoga or acupuncture, which is like a 5,000-year-old, you know, system that is in- incredibly effective. It's like, I get this pill for you, you know, I'm going to look the other way. You know, it's not like these are evil people. They're just doing their job, you know. It's, thank God we have surgeons and stuff. But the medical industry, it's driven by profit, and it's driven by uh, kind of a Western philosophy, an allopathic, non-integrated philosophy. So there is a better approach, a more holistic approach. Now take that same example to say geology, archaeology, and anthropology, and it's like carbon dating is great. You know, I work with teams of professionals. I've been on digs. I I, I thoroughly understand the tools of anthropology and archaeology, and we need them to solve problems. But it's not a holistic approach. It, it they they don't consider. You know, they throw out ten thousand years of evidence and oral traditions and religious documents and. It's just stunning, like, all these people are saying the same thing. Like, my boy, Carl Jung, says, primitive people do not invent myths, they experience them. You know, it's like, you know, I've sat down with wisdom keepers and medicine men and women and and, uh, just heard all around the world the the most specific and bizarre story about the past that is not in alignment with the, um, the general consensus of the orthodox archaeology. And I will say by the end of the show, hopefully, the vision I think we lay out of, of the past answers all the questions of myth and legend and strange creatures and great floods and lost worlds with science answers none of it. They're, they're mute on the subject. It's like, you know, these highly intelligent people that have this enormous respect for their ancestors, like past this lineage of information in, a, like I said, a very specific way in isolated places all around the world. And we ought to tell them that, you know, they're out for lunch and they just don't understand, you know, what science is all about. So it's an anti-logic question. I just feel like uh, it screams out to be corrected, you know, our, our current way of looking at things. What do you think happened? You've mentioned Young twice, and I, I kind of uh, want to just stay on that. I want to figure your mind out, too, as well, like Young would have tried to do. So, which is this, <laughs> <laughs> which is this. He was, uh, uh, for much of his career, um, uh, laying things out um, for us, and he was, you know, respected, still is, 
But then later on, something happened, something metaphysical when he started talking about the door in his brain and, and he, he went to the, he saw something and then he started to understand that there was something else going on too, as well, where he was trying to straighten us all out so we could understand ourselves. And then something happened. What, what do you think it was? Did, did, you know, was, did he encounter a, a, a shaman somewhere that, ayahuasca uh you know i don't know what do, what do you think uh opened up his mind that that's a good point I, I think he never uh talked about uh doing medicine ceremonies with with any uh mystics or shamans uh which i've done myself uh numerous times in ecuador and peru uh ayahuasca san pedro uh as basically just uh you know diving into whatever I can to find out the truth. So, uh, sure. You know, jumping on the grenade because because ayahuasca is not pleasant. It, it's a hellish roller coaster sometimes. But young, I think his effort and 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 um, open mindedness and and kind of a rigorous intention to analyze the one uh, probably broke him through to a certain level. Like like you have people who um, like channels or, you know, they have different abilities. We all have different skill sets, but there are within the multiplicity of time and space, there are energetic levels from the lowest to the highest. And there are like universal libraries, if you will, that's what Casey tapped into. And, you know, like once again, I'm sure the audience is very hip to uh, channels and, and, and uh, see people that are channeling higher information. So I, I think that young was a mystic. I, you know, I'm a fan of reincarnation. I believe you keep coming back and he's just one of those beings who opened the door like Freud for us to be having conversations like this and having people interested in it. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, and just like Joseph Campbell, it's like the journey of the hero, you know, looking through myth and legend and seeing with all these similar cultures we're talking about. And I think if they were both to be sat down and talked to today, they would both say that their experience is that there was a mother culture or cultures that spread out and disseminated uh, this religious information, this spiritual um, alchemy and understanding of, of uh, you know, the nature of the self. And they would probably talk about Atlantis and Lemuria, frankly. I, I believe that Campbell would have definitely thought that that was a reality. And unfortunately, they're both on the other side right now or back again. But, uh, both those guys were tapping into the lodger. You know, you, you know how it is. You get synchronicity. You're like, I know that person, Jesus Christ, from another life or whatever. It's like so obvious that uh, we're all connected in, in some holographic way, you know? And do you think that uh, all of this has been hidden in oral traditions, in myths, uh, uh, you know, throughout history with the mystery schools for a reason? Because here today, now we're encountering these issues with the man, right? And if we, if we would have had it uh, uh, sourced or in another place, then we would be in uh, some more trouble. Also, they kept it hidden from the man that way, right? Yes, that, that's a good point. That, um, like the Rosicrucians and Freemasons, uh, they, their, their uh, lineage goes back, or their. their um, mysticism, esoteric understanding goes back, they say, to Atlantis. They, they both specifically say Atlantis existed and was destroyed in the Great Flood, much like the Theosophist, Casey, Steiner, Blavatsky, uh, Plato, on and on, uh, Herodotus. So what you have is, you know, this, this lineage that goes back that had to be kept secret. So if you look at a lot of the occultism, it's all symbolism. And sometimes it looks like, oh, that's satanic, right? You got Baphomet with the horned head and the goat head. And it was just like an androgynous balance of the opposites. And, you know, basically like the Kundalini system, the energy of enlightenment, you know, and how you uh, take on these different um, kind of prayers and, and, and behaviors to liberate yourself from the lower self. And Casey talks about a lot of this uh, in Atlantis and, and the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And you have this, information that's more widely disseminated now but all throughout history you know the printing press wasn't uh created till a couple hundred years ago we didn't understand the unconscious until freud you know we basically just set the stage for this flood of information to come out now and this crazy time at the at this crossroads in human history so yes uh 
there are darker forces at work in the world, just like they were in Atlantean times. That's the nature of, um, uh, I'm not going to say it's the nature of duality, but it, it, it is, um, it's a choice and a poor choice to, to try to, you know, gain power over people and to just like, um, not orient yourself for the good of all, you know? And I think a lot of people who are into ancient mysteries are these recycled Atlanteans who were like sons and daughters of the law of one who basically, they want a better world. They're kind of pissed, you know, they're kind of like uh, sick of, of, of war and destruction and insanity and they want their voices to be heard and they want, you know, a saner world. So I see a lot of that happening as crazy as things are you see all these um voices of reason coming out and 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 expressing themselves do you think that science is going to accidentally present the evidence for atlantis and lumeria and i'm talking specifically about something like you know coral reefs or the spreading of seeds and and uh, you know, flora and fauna uh, throughout the Pacific, where they're going to present this information, and the only way that could happen is from a continent and a connected island chain. Yeah, you know, once again, I'm not a believer in academic conspiracies, but I see how limiting, uh, you know, we have this left brain male dominated Cartesian model uh, of subject and object where the mystical or the, sci- uh, the spiritual is not blended with the scientific. Now, if you talk, if you listen to the Casey material, he talks about in ancient times, there was a blending of science and spirituality. And he like specifically talks about, you know, uh, places in South America, like say Saksiwam and Pumapunku, that they were Atlantean colonies. And the places were built with sound and light and levitation, uh, like not really a laser, it's kind of like a... Um, a spiritual technology. That's why, you know, you don't find a, you know, machines there or whatever that, that it was like these beings that showed up after the flood, you know, like carrying man bags and spreading, you know, these androgynous created gods, the land of the gods and that Atlantis was, they are, you know, disseminating this, this, this spiritual technology and know-how, if you will. So anyways, um, I think that, Beneath the, the oceans are where evidence will be found to, to answer your question about a lost civilization. I really think, I, I don't think, like, like so I'll give you an example. Uh, we have Gobekli Tepe, of course. We mm-hmm. know, you know, know it very well. But it's 12,000 years old, and some of the similar iconography that you see there is found in other places. And my buddy Graham Hancock who talked to Carl Schmidt, the head archaeologist there, before he passed away. And Schmidt was just amazed that the oldest enclosures at Gobekli Tepe were the most sophisticated. Then over a thousand years, they denigrated and they were just really lame, you know? And it's like, that's not how progress works or evolution of, of, of building techniques, engineering and understanding work. It looks like a transfer of technology. And a lot of the iconography and symbolism is telling us that. So we have events like that, that are chipping away. You know, now we have a new scientific study that just came out that 12,800 years ago, the, the event the cataclysmic event that was the younger driest impact um, that hit the U.S. ice sheet, it was worse than the, six, the uh, event 65 million years ago that killed off the dinosaurs, the Chicxulub uh, meteor crater. Mm-hmm. 10% of the entire Earth's land mass was burned 13,000 years ago. So we are dealing with intense cataclysm. Plus, when you're looking for a 20, 30,000 year old city, man, there was just so much there anyways without the cataclysm. That, that is disintegrated and destroyed. But that's a long-winded way of saying, I do believe that we will find it. I think it's the collective mind that has to open up uh, more and more and more because our mind collectively is creating our re- reality and we are collectively obfuscating the truth from ourselves. And there's... see more like... Yeah, right? Yeah, no, go ahead. Finish, finish. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you see more change like, wow... The collective mind is opening, even things like, like sex abuse or something like that, that have been hush-hush for so long. And, you know, like open-minded guys like us understood that there is this behavior that goes on that's unacceptable. But it, it's like in the public now, it's like, you know, this is no longer acceptable to, to act like that. There are all these changes in society that are a function of kind of the collective mind opening up. And with all the UFO stuff that's coming out, you know, like, you know, we, we probably got 
jumped on, you know, years ago when you would talk about like, I'm sure there's a secret program in the government that's, you know, looking into extraterrestrials. But of course, just like the NSA taking all your information, you know, it's true. And then it comes out, right? Well, and, and there's two things. Yes, absolutely. And there's two things that come into play here, especially when we're talking about the Younger Dryas period. Yeah, we have the melting of the 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 glacier ice, um, which was tremendous. And that changes the sea levels. But there's something else that most people don't understand or they don't wrap their mind around enough. And that's the sea floor itself changes too. It's not just the sea level and the amount of water, but where the sea floor is uh, increases and decreases. And and when you combine the two of those, there are huge uh, chunks of land, uh, continents that have been there. It's not just sea level. It's also the seabed itself changing its uh, elevation. Yes. And I think it was 1911, Pierre Termier at the Smithsonian, he gave a talk about basically um, all the different branches of science were coming around to the belief that, that Atlantis was a reality after many years of, you know, for the longest time it was taken as fact. Then when these new um, scientists like uh, anthropology and archaeology were formed in the 1800s, they started to get away from that idea because anything religious, anything mystical, there was essentially a war against, you know, even things like giants, which I'm well versed in. It's like the, it was this huge, like, uh, war like there is now it's like a polarized war of of like religion and atheist or 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 republican and democrat and back then it was the scientific and religion war that continues to the day so you know Jeremy had talked about these uh you know oceanographic geological um you know uh anthropological archaeological evidence for for atlantis existing and you have then you had a backlash, like a bunch of oceanographers and geologists basically gave a bunch of like faulty reasons why a continent couldn't exist in the early Atlantic. And ever since then, people have just pointed to it and said, oh, you know, professionals and skeptics, like, it's impossible that there was a continent there. And if your um, listeners are familiar with Randall Carson, oh, yeah. he was like a self-taught, yeah, yeah, he, he's brilliant. And uh, he does a really good job of explaining, um, you know, why it is uh, not just possible but probable that Atlantis ex- existed in uh, geological terms. He, he's brilliant. He's pals with Graham Hancock, and you know I really feel like um, um, what you're talking about is, is you know there, there was some extreme devastation and possibly even a pole shift or a magnetic shift that Casey talked about. Uh, on top of that, you just think of like. You know, I deal with like uh, a lot of colonial sites, you know, that are just a couple hundred years old and they just disappear to, um, you know, right right out of the blue after no time. Think of 10,000 years or 15,000 years. And that's exactly the point. Right, right, right. And amnesia is an amazing thing. We we have no idea about <laughs> Roanoke, and that's recent history, right? So there you go. Let's take a break right yep. here. Our guest tonight, Jim Vieira. We're talking about Atlantis and Lemuria. And when we come back after this break, we're going to jump straight into it. I want definitions of Atlantis and Lemuria, and we'll take off from there. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Jim Vieira right after this short break. Stay with us. Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, Fader Knots. This is Jimmy Church, and I'm introducing New Pharma, a company whose products are based on science, human function based on the endocannabinoid system or ECS. New Pharma firmly believes in this science, and their research indicates that support of the ECS provides the beneficial effects for a healthy lifestyle. 
New Pharma's science includes relief capsules for pain relief, sleep capsules, which are natural support for occasional sleeplessness. Foundation is support for your ECS, and Fit Capsules support your active lifestyle. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B for a 33% discount on all of their products. Or visit newpharma.com for all of the knowledge on the science. That's G-N-U-Pharma.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Hi, this is Ray Sobbs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Ancient Life Oil. Life changing. The real oil. CBD is truly ancient life oil from the source. This oil has no psychoactive effect and is also legal in all 50 states. When you're healthy, you're happy. The truth about this wonderful plant is that it wants to give back to mankind. Life, longevity, and happiness. Ancient life oil are golden grade. All organic, non-GMO, and infused with high-quality liquid coconut oil. It's simple. Just go to ancient ancientlifeoil.com today that's ancientlifeoil.com the best purest organic and non-gmo cbd in the world go back lee tappy the statements made regarding these products have not been evaluated by the food and drug administration these products are not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease please consult your healthcare professional about potential interactions or other possible complications before using any product this is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Monday, kicking off the week tonight, Jim Vieira is with us. And what's really cool is uh, Contact in the Desert is coming up uh, June 1st through the 4th. And, Jim, you're going to be speaking there, and some of the presentations uh, you're going to be doing is on Edgar Casey and Atlantis and Lemuria. Uh, yes, that's a, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, yeah, Contact in the Desert's a really cool event, and it's early June in Indian Wells, California. It was at the first or the fourth, as you said. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, my main talk is going to be, um, about the lost world of Edgar Casey. I got to narrow it down. I got like 500 images. Um, uh, I'm like the rain man of 18 minutes. <laughs> I got to like, I think I need a girlfriend or something. But anyways, uh, you know, I show examples of all these these different themes I'm talking about, you know, petroglyphs and art and, and um, imagery with six fingers and six toes all around the planet, you know, uh, creative gods with man bags, androgynous beings, like all these themes um, I hit on um, that, that Casey talked about and all these other sources that I've mentioned also talk about. Once again, very bizarre and specific view of the past from disconnected sources scattered throughout thousands of years of time. So a very compelling argument for the veracity of this material. Plus, all these sources, and a lot of them, they're really, um, you're tapping into a universal library. So we're not getting the convoluted human ego story. We're, we're moving past that because we all want to know what the past was. So once again, I do a comparative analysis of all these sources, even you know scientific sources too, to try to piece together what, what went on. I'm also doing a talk with my boy, uh, Hugh Newman, um, and I'm doing another talk in Atlantis and Lemuria, Edgar Cayce's vision of these places. So contact in the desert is definitely worth, worth going into. It should be a lot of fun. It's a really uh, little run, cool, um, um, 
entertaining thing to, to check out. It, it is such a huge conference, and what is going to be amazing for you is uh, what you see uh, how many uh, of the Fader Knots, our audience, is there in force, and they're going to be coming up to you going, dude, you were amazing on Fade to Black, man. And, and it's, <laughs> it's, uh, you're going to go, wow. It's, it's, it's so much fun. The, the conference itself is, it is really, really big, but it's the way that they uh, organize this and put this together. It is just so much fun to go through, and, and I just can't wait to, uh, I'll introduce you. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that I, uh, introduce, uh, one of your, uh, one of your presentations out there. It's, it'll be my pleasure. I just really want to do that for the fade or not. It's going to be great. Um, now this is, cool. uh, this is where I, I want to go. We have, uh, two different situations here that are c- completely connected and they're connected throughout history too, as well, whether it goes back to the middle East and Egypt, but uh, certainly uh, with the Atlantic and the Pacific and Atlantis and at the Atlantic Ocean, we make those connections uh, s- easily enough. Lemuria is a, is a strange character. You really have to get into the research of of our uh, uh, supernatural world to uh, start to get an understanding of Lemuria. But in a general mm-hmm. sense, and this is where I want you to help me with this definition, Lemuria is associated with the Pacific Ocean. So let me get your two definitions. Uh, what is Lemuria, and when and where? Uh, yes, Casey's vision of Atlantis, of, of, of Lemuria was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And basically, he it, it's a strange, you know... Um, Tale. It's basically a, a story of, of humans or, or spirit beings, if you will, that were more in etheric form. Now, that might sound like, you know, I took a couple of hits of acid, but I'm just conveying what, what Casey and Steiner and others said, that, that it was more like, you know, we were spirit beings who kind of like were investigating this world. And that we started to get drawn into it more and more, you know, like some biblical fall where we got uh, ensnared in matter. But much like Atlantis, we had at the time, or the, the being, human beings, or, you know, they were more androgynous oriented, quite frankly, at the time, which is another strange phenomena. But the third eye was supposed to be connected to the spiritual realms, so you didn't get ensnared here. But then there's a lot of, um, and there's talk about this in the Bible, you know, the, the, the Nephilim and the sons and the sons of God took human wives and things like that. It was like this, these spirit beings got ensnared in the world down here. And I would say a world of like, um, of different human species and human cousins where homo sapiens as sources all around the world, you know, the Sumerian texts talk about, it, it seems like almost an extraterrestrial or supernatural genetic intervention to create that strange species that we are that Casey wasn't get it into evolution. It was that there was uh, coexisting realities like uniformitarianism and um, catastrophism in geology. They both can exist. So you have evolution as we think we know it, and then we have genetic intervention. And frankly, you must uh, um, give up the fact that there is the supernatural seems to be at work here too. or or the extraterrestrial. I I really, you know, I don't have a time machine. I can only point to, you know, what all these beings are saying. So Casey talks about that. Lemuria was a place where um, it was very peaceful, like the Pacific Ocean, you know, and and it was also called Pan. That's where Japan came from. Like these names resonate, you know, the Atlantic Ocean and Aztalan was the Aztec's homeland and on and on and on. So you find a lot of moo. In, in all around the Pacific Islands. Um, so Casey had it basically uh, existing a couple million years ago up until uh, a little before the Great Flood 12, 13,000 years ago. So it basically, just like Atlantis, it went underneath uh, the waves in an ancient cataclysm. And there was a belief that Easter Island uh, was once part of um, Lemuria, or at the very least there were um, refugees who went there. I kind of independently found different four different cases 
of petroglyphs with six fingers and six toes and statues with six fingers and six toes on Easter Island, as well as some awesome stonework, as we all know, a written language. You know, there's a lot of reasons to think that there was a connection to a lost world in, in that place. It's so enigmatic and so isolated, and it has all the air marks that you wouldn't expect. You would expect after a flood and wouldn't expect from an isolated island of indigenous people. So Lemuria was basically, uh, uh, it, it coexisted alongside Atlantis. And Casey has the Lemurians going to the Yucatan, going to Egypt 10,000 years ago to build the Great Pyramid with Atlanteans and found that civilization. And then if you go study the Olmec people in, in Mexico, you find, you know, like the, the, the heads, they're like West African features and Chinese features. And Casey said that the Yucatan was a melting pot from Lemuria and Atlantis. And I was just there. I did a tour with Brian Forrester and Hugh Newman. And, um, you know, it's amazing. It's just like clearly Asian uh, beings are represented everywhere and West African and Samoan. It is truly a, a melting pot. In the Olmec, they go back, back at least 1800 BC, but maybe even older. And they pass along all the high engineering and uh, high minded thoughts to the Mayans. The Mayans did not come up with, um, you know, the, the glyph system. They got it from the Olmecs. And the Olmecs might be older than we think. So these cultures disseminated at different points around the globe uh, after the destruction of Atlantis and Lemuria. And now, you know, what, I, I'm sorry. I, no, I'll that's okay. Um, and and when we are talking about, uh, and I want to get back to the six fingers uh, too as well. Uh, uh, how? What kind of time stamp are we putting on Lemuria? Fifty thousand years old, older maybe? Uh, oh. Can? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I I would say several hundred thousand. There's like. Like Blavatsky and all these sources, they talk about different root races. I think we're like the fourth or the fifth. They talk about you know different incarnations of humans in this experimental attempt, and like these etheric bodies might have been you know I think Casey says like a million years ago or ten million years ago, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until a couple hundred thousand years ago until like Atlantis. The timeline is two hundred thousand years ago. We basically uh, humans are. Or, or, you know, human-like beings are thrust into matter. And then 50,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, and 12,000 years ago, there are three cataclysms that break up the land and eventually completely submerge it. Now, so you have refugees. Yep, go on. No, no, go ahead. That's exactly where I was going. Okay, so the refugees. They end up in the American Southwest. The American yeah. Southwest. Now, what about, okay, so now we have, uh, uh, if you look today, this is what I was talking about with science. If you look today in, in Google Earth and you look from Easter Island all the way into, uh, you know, if you, Fiji, the string of islands out there, and, and then up to Hawaii, you can see stuff there. I mean, it looks like you can just imagine the water being lower, the oceans being lower, and that land actually being higher, and the combination of the two, that is a big chunk of land. And it's not, uh, it's not hard to see. You can actually, the evidence of it is right there. Yeah, it's, um, it's going to take some, some doing, some remote... Um operated vehicles, some dives, some more intense focus. I'm working with a, a satellite archaeology researcher who has, uh, I'm more, you know, uh, we're looking through her 20 years of research um, at all these anomalies above or on land and underneath the ocean. And I really feel like, um, you know, like you keep pointing out, that that's the, that's the final frontier, basically, is beneath the oceans to solve these, these mysteries because, Human populations were always by uh, the oceans, and four or five hundred feet in sea level rise is an enormous uh, amount overnight, twelve thousand years ago. So a lot is under the water, um, and, and a lot is found in the Mediterranean. We just found a three thousand year old Uratu castle in Lake Van in Turkey. Uh, you know, Lake Titicaca has been rumored uh, to have ruins, like megalithic ruins. 
underneath the, the ocean there or the waves there. So, I'm yeah, starting, to, uh, Jim, I'm starting to lose you. Uh, speak up into the phone. Oh, oh. Okay, sorry. Oh, there you okay. go. Okay, we're good. We're good. Yeah, my bad. I was just saying that, um, you know, th- there are ruins underwater that we know about, but there's even more that we don't know about. And to your point, uh, you know, I, I think that is eventually how we're going to unravel this, you know, problem. It's funny. It's like a bus could hit me tomorrow. And it's not like this is, this mystery is going away. Like people are going to keep digging. There's a fascination because there is an understanding. It just rings true intuitively, you know? Yeah. And well, I have, a, yeah, I know. And I have a problem when it comes to Easter Island, about uh, you know a couple of canoes arriving from two thousand miles away, I just I have a problem with that. Those canoes came from a couple of miles away. That's that's what I think, and uh, yep. you know it's not it's not two thousand miles. All, um, now you keep um, you've uh, referenced the six fingers, so let's go back to that. What are you talking mm-hmm. about when you talk about six fingers? Excellent. I'm glad you made that mention. Um, most, um, the most well-known quote about six fingers and six toes is, uh, the Bible, Samuel twenty-one twenty. the giant of Gath had six fingers and six toes, 24 digits and all. It's a very, you know, there were 23 mentions of Bibles and, uh, of, of giants in the Bible. <clears throat> and specifically this account talks about six fingers and six toes, uh, possessed by the giant of gas. So that's, that's a pretty specific thing, right? So then you have what I found a lot of too is petroglyphs and, um, you know, examples of, of polydactylism, which is six fingers and six toes all around the globe, you know, in, in Australia, the, the rock out there, there these huge guardian spirits that have six fingers, and six toes, uh, Texas, Utah, all around the Southwest, like giant hands and giant toes, not just normal size, like 20 inch feet that are, have six toes on them. And then in Baja, California, you have beings with six fingers and six toes filled with arrows shot through by a petroglyph man with five fingers and toes. It's this kind of like story of an ancient people warring with, with like regular native Americans. And, uh, Edgar Casey says, he only has one reading about this and it's really interesting. He says that one of the places that the Lemurians went to, um, uh, the, I'm sorry, the refugees went to was in the Gobi desert and they built a city of gold and Mu Zuen in 9,026 BC was a refugee from Lemuria. And he was going to the Gobi desert and Casey explains that he had six fingers and six toes. He was six foot tall with blue eyes, and blonde hair. And it was, you know, thought that Caucasians weren't in the area. And it was considered, you know, that's kind of a crazy thing. And then recently they found the Tarim Basin mummies in the same area that Casey talked about this being uh, going to visit this, this lost city. And they found between six foot and six foot six mummies of red and blonde hair, blue eyed, uh, Indo European ca- Caucasoid people. So it was like a prophetic thing, once again, that Casey was predicting. And he said that they had six fingers, but the mummies didn't. But I just think, you know, what Casey's pointing to is that the six fingers and six toes come from the lost worlds of Atlantis and Lemuria. It was a characteristic of the gods. And, you know, the gods, not really gods, just advanced beings with advanced abilities. So... I can't tell you. I found on the Austral Islands, just let me run through them, uh, indulge me for a minute. Easter Island, Hawaii, Fiji, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, like 11 different states in the United States. And, uh, you know, art and and, uh, statues all around the Mediterranean, uh, the hypogeum, a six-fingered handprint in Malta at that uh, underground temple where they found the elongated skulls and uh, you know, I don't want to be long winded too much about these things, but it's, it's really stunning how many examples of, of petroglyphs are all around the world and how, of, of six fingers and six toes and how giant a lot of them are right next to normal size, uh, petroglyphs. So the Bible says it, Casey says it, it seems to be part of this idea of a lost world. And, 
you know, I, and the evidence is right there. It's not just like, well, that's a fairy tale. It is on every isolated Pacific Island on a giant statue or a, a you know, like a, a huge footprint dug out right there on, on um, you know, an isolated Pacific Island with a huge uh, petrogol for six toes. You know, it's really like boggles the mind. Well, it takes, uh, it's so worth mentioning and so important to continue to mention in ancient times, the amount of work that it took to carve a statue, to quarry the stone, um, to design it and get it done, it was a lifetime for a lot of these artisans back then. But they did not make the mistake of six fingers when they meant to carve five. Right? It just, it just did, didn't work that way. You did it with intent, and if they carve six fingers, that's because there was six fingers. They didn't, you know, you know what I mean. There wasn't a mistake there. Uh, the the design and yes. the work it, it took a lifetime for them to create. They did it with intent, Jim. And the um, what they're defining over and over again is the supernatural or the gods. You know that the, these great beings. There's always a divine aspect associated to this too, and even in um, the Library of Ashburnipal from uh, 700 BC in, in Samaria, many of the cuneiform tablets I saw at the British Museum, they specifically talk about what six fingers and six toes mean, and it has supernatural affiliations. And in all over Africa, I found six fingers and six toes, and uh, Credo Mutwa, the um, I think he's from Zimbabwe, and uh, they call him, you know, he's a medicine man. And he says that the Zulu sun god is represented by six fingers and six toes, you know, in this isolated place. And then once again, in Oklahoma and, you know, everywhere else around the U.S., you have these petroglyphs with six fingers and six toes, and this affiliation with the supernatural, with the lost world or the gods, you know. It's like there's only so much of this coincidence you can take before you, like, really question it. And, and uh and you look at the specificity too, and you're, you're absolutely right. This isn't. Oops, I, I made a um, you know a mistake. I'll quickly say I just went on a tour of the Yucatan, like I said. So we start at Teotihuacan, and I find um, you know uh, a statue with, with six fingers and six toes. We go to uh, Mexico City in the Aztec Museum. There, they have two Aztec murals, and both of the gods have six toes. Clearly, all four of their feet have six toes. And then I go to Palenque, and there's like three different reliefs of, of fingers and toes with six fingers and six toes. And then I go to multiple museums and find the same thing. And then I end up at Tulum, and there's a handprint with seven fingers on it. You know, so it's like this theme is carried wherever I go across the world. Well, and I believe uh, then you can go all the way back to Urfa Man. Right uh, up in Gobekli Tepe, one of the like the first statue ever carved on planet Earth. And there's two things about this that blow my mind. One, he's got some pretty stylish clothes, right, for being a however old, fifteen thousand years old. But he's also got six fingers. <laughs> yes, I should hire you. You you asked like uh, the most prophetic questions. First of all, the Tarim Basin mummies that they found in China, the Caucasoid mummies, they had incredibly tailored clothes that were highly sophisticated. And, you know, Casey had talked about this, too, just like you have this guy with an eighth grade education in the 20s and 30s basically um, saying what seemed to be utterly outrageous things about genetics and, and human migrations and the dates of, of different civilizations. And as time goes on, you know, lo and behold, he has proven right more and more. And Arthur Man and Gobekli Tepe, it's funny because that's another thing, that these characteristics of, of the original state of humans being androgynous and six fingers and six toes, they go back to Jericho, you know, the walls of Jericho. And Ayin Ghazal, some of the oldest statues in the world, There, there's a paper written by Eric Ziffer, uh, uh, an Israeli archaeologist in 2007, and it's called Ayin Gazel, uh, Androgynous Adam in the First Humans. He basically points to an ancestor cult that had six fingers and six toes and were androgynous, and this is like a respected academic. Right. So what Gobekli Tepe 
Ayim Gazal and these, these other sites, you have the, this, this ancient iconography and this cult worship of beings that had six fingers and six toes and, you know, were androgynous also. And you see some of the symbolism, that androgynous symbolism, that Gobekli Tepe as well. That's why I'm anxious, and I'm sure you are, to see what happens the more enclosures they dig out at Gobekli Tepe. Are we going to see more of those man bags? Are we going to see more of um, six fingers and six toes and androgyny? Because the, the belief is, after the flood, the creator gods or the survivors, the advanced survivors who showed up, they embodied these bizarre uh, characteristics, uh, and they had supernatural powers, and they repromulgated society in Samaria and Peru and other places, Egypt, uh, in Gobekli Tepe, and in, in, in the um, you know that that whole area. So, you know, I'm I'm anxiously waiting more more digs, but yes. That's pretty cool with, with Urfa Man there. Yeah, Urfa Man blows my mind. And uh, the more that I... And what the rest of the world doesn't understand the importance of Urfa Man and other, you know, megalithic structures and statues around the world. But Urfa Man is so old, and we are supposed to uh, believe that Stone Age Man was wearing, you know, animal skins and running around with clubs. And then you look at Urfa Man, and that is about as stylized as it gets. But then again, I go back to my point, Jim, that it took a lot of effort to carve Urfa Man. A lot of effort. This is a major, you know, this is a big statue, and he's got six fingers. How do you make that kind of mistake? You know, it's it's clearly uh, saved and preserved for us to observe today about what was going on back then. And, I, you know, and they are trying to suppress this knowledge. And I just don't understand why. But I just think it's 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 like um, it's funny. Uh, in geology, you have the gradualists. They, they just hate catastrophism. It's mm-hmm. like PTSD in, right. in the academic world. It's like I want to, things to be understood in slow, predictable ways. I do not want to yield anything to the religious side to believe in the supernatural or the mystic. You know, I, I want to basically solve problems from within a paradigm um, that, that I am comfortable with, that we can all fake agree upon. And, and, you know, there is rigorous peer review, but it's done by a flawed system, you know. And, I, you know, it's not like I don't agree with carbon dating. I, I just see it as like a – it's just one of these old stuck ways of, of, um, of viewing reality. A, you know, like a, you just have a perceptual shift. Uh, just right now, just think like we could have uh, um, interdimensional, multidimensional beings coming in and out of our dimension right now. And they talk about, you know, science is proving that there's nine dimensions or 11 dimensions or whatever the hell it is. The brain like operates in like 11 dimensions. And, you know, and when you have mystical experiences and you're like sitting with the shaman doing ayahuasca or something, you know, you tap into a different reality. You know, I, it's funny because I'm always encouraging like scientists, friend of friends of mine, I said, "Yeah, come with me." They're, they're more afraid of ayahuasca than they are Atlantis. You know what I, mean? like, I know, and I we're mean, we, exactly. <laughs> we're going to talk about that when we come back. And uh, the, one other thing, as we head to this break, Jim, you just brought up one of the uh, for me one of the most fascinating points when it comes to archaeologists and historians and anthropology. You know that, that it's all about the carbon dating when they want to argue with us, right? And then Gobekli Tepe comes along that wasn't supposed to exist. Carbon dating says twelve thousand years old, and now they want to go. Well, you know, man was uh, pretty smart back then. It's just like it's, you know, it's, you can't win the argument, even when you bring you present them with their own evidence, which is carbon dating. All right, this is oh, move, move. yep, <laughs> yep. I know. We'll, we'll talk about Atlantis when we come back. Yep. Our guest tonight, Jim Vieira. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. 
Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk. Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All new Mana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the new Mana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the new Mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously. Go back, Lee Tappy. Do you worry a lot whether you're a college student, busy professional, parent, or grandparent? Ongoing stress and elevated levels of the stress hormone cortisol can rob your memory, your health, and your future. Now you can combat the effects of stress and anxiety while improving your memory and recall at the same time with the dietary supplement Calm and Clever. Studies show that the ingredients in Calm and Clever reduce cortisol by as much as 30% in one to two weeks. Call 1-800-758-8746 or calmandclever.com. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com Hi, folks. CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why, you ask? Because of what it does for the body. And fortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. Do your due diligence and log on to AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Jim Vieira. And Jim will be speaking at Contact in the Desert this year, along with yours truly. And tickets and info are right there at jimmychurchradio.com. Click on the Contact in the Desert banner. Now, Jim, we were talking about the big A, right? Atlantis. And uh, um, I've talked to Robert Schock about this uh, personally over the years. And he says this, that in academic circles... Um, the the big A right Atlantis you can't mention it you, that that's it that Atlanta and I always thought it was aliens and he said to me you know what you can talk about aliens now in in academic circles that A is 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 okay it's it's strange it's Atlantis is still off limits absolutely it's uh, I do agree because if you talk about alien life. You can, uh, you know, have it both ways and you can talk about, well, you know, it's obvious that this universe is all about sprouting life everywhere. You know, that, that's pretty obvious. And there might be life elsewhere. or Maybe they traveled here. But when you mention Atlantis, it's basically an affront to archaeologists. It's like, you know, you're telling me that we missed out on this <clears throat> advanced civilization 
and you know we haven't found it underneath the ocean and and uh you know when you look at it in terms once again i'll mention coexisting realities <clears throat> so you you have uniform uniformitarianism in geology right it's like everything is slow and gradual and then you have catastrophism which we know exists too so there are like gradualists who are really ardent uh, attackers of the idea that there was any catastrophism and they've always uh, like uh, held sway over the public opinion about geology, but it's starting to change. We're starting to see that catastrophism is, is more the norm. So in anthropology, in archaeology, you can have different uh, coexisting realities. In anthropology, evolution is, is happening. We can see it. We understand there are evolution of species, but at the same time, it could be an evolutionary curveball like we're talking about, like a genetic intervention to create Homo sapiens that all the the uh, esoteric documents talk about. And then in archaeology, archaeology has done a good job explaining you know, the last couple thousand years of evolution of society. But could they be missing a chapter back 15, 20, 50,000 years ago where alongside with Salutrians and hunter-gatherers, there was a sophisticated civilization that existed? Therein lies the problem because you can see the evolution of, of uh, tool um, construction, and you could see how humans did evolve in a certain way. Um, and there was hunter-gatherers that existed, not side by side, but on the same planet 50,000 years ago, along with a sophisticated civilization in the middle of the Atlantic. So they're not really, they're looking at everything upside down. When they, you know, look at Happel Group X or Happel Group uh, B, like these, um, uh, mitochondrial DNA markers. Is, it's not like, oh, you know what really answers this question? Not that Salutrians came from York, America, but there was a continent in the middle of the Atlantic with Happel Group X that went in both directions. Or there was technology and know-how spread all around the globe. That's why you have a similar, you know, symbolism, iconography, spiritual practices, building uh, construction techniques, because there was a mother culture that went under the waves that Plato talked about and so many other sources have talked about. So, you know, the, the end state is that Atlantis is considered verboten, but I think it's a juvenile taboo, and you should be able to talk about um, the subject. I, I think it's just asinine and childish not to talk about it. Now, uh, let's uh, we, have, we have Plato's, uh, which I, I think by all accounts uh, is a direct reference to... Atlantis. We have Edgar Casey. We'll talk about both of those, but also yep. e in uh, Egypt, uh, in Edfu, documents an island uh, uh, that predated uh, dynastic Egypt, and that reference is there too as well. Um, it's not like this is complete mythology. It's uh, there is direct reference throughout history. That, that's a very good point because. A lot of these arguments are made in bad faith because they'll say there's no direct, you know, uh, they don't even talk about Edgar Casey. There's no direct mention of Atlantis other than Plato. And, you know, the reality is Herodotus mentions Atlantis before Plato was even born. That's which right. Is really interesting. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Theopompus, an alien. There, there was a whole host of, of, of chroniclers who mention Atlantis. But there were also a million mentions of the continent of the gods in the middle of the Atlantic or the middle of the Pacific from cultures all around the world. Uh, the British Isles, they, they all have different names for it, though. You know, like Zeptepe is the first time, like you said, for, in, in Egypt. You know, this, this, uh, this place where the um, where Thoth and all these, these wisdom bringers showed up from. And there was a cataclysm, and they showed up. And they, they're carrying man bags, and they got, like, ibis heads, and they're spreading wisdom and, and teaching. You know, it, it's, it's really fascinating. Like, when you read the Sumerian texts, um, all the different translations, not just the Sitchin stuff. I, I read, like, the Christopher O'Brien stuff, this noted geologist who worked for Ramco in Iran. He wrote The Shining Ones. And, and you read all the, the Sumerian stuff, it's like... They were clearly advanced beings who showed up in, you know, like Lebanon area, probably 9,000 BC. And it, they were like social planners and engineers. And, you know, they cared for, they showed the people how to like care for um, um, the animals. 
how to create, you know, sewer systems and everything. They were just like these advanced beings who clearly showed up after a flood. And this is happening all around the world. These beings are showing up, you know, after a great flood 12, 11,000 years ago. And they're all portrayed in a similar fashion. I wanted and, to add, wait, wait, yeah, let me, is, yeah. wait, let me jump in really quick. I yeah, thought yeah. I thought I planted a flag here, right? I thought I, I discovered something years ago, which was these purses, right? These man bags, and and I I started to see them in different cultures. I was bringing it up here on the show. It turns out I'm not the only one to have noticed this, right? But I did it independently, and I'm thinking, what what is, is it? It's like the nuclear suitcase, right? That we have today. That these are showing up everywhere, and to have it uh, not only with uh, the Sumerian uh, 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 carvings, but it goes all the way back now to Gobekli Tepe. It's it, and it, which it's all over Gobekli Tepe. There is something going on. What is inside of those purses? <clears throat> That's the uh, million dollar question. Um, yeah, you know, there are, I think people like uh, really dig the idea of a lost technology. You know, I don't even know. It could be, for me, hallucinogenics, um, some kind of like DNA, something symbolic of uh, of um, passing on the arts of civilization. It could be literally seeds, but it seems like something more supernatural. I, I you know, I wish I had a time machine, but I, I what I'll say is that you have the man bags at Gobekli Tepe. Now, now let me just hit on this theme, like Plato, all the sources I've mentioned along with Casey say that our, our original state was androgynous. You know, like when you have, um, um, like humans being made on the potter's wheel, like at, uh, uh, Ed, was it, Esna in, in Egypt, you know, like these reliefs where Khufu, I mean, Kanum, the uh, androgynous creator God is making humans he has six fingers on the temple relief uh, at Esna, and he's creating humans on a potter's wheel. And that theme is carried all around the world. It's, it's like um, Casey said, basically, you would uh, birth or ensoul a body. Like, you wouldn't have, the original humans didn't, like, have sexual intercourse. And it's this, I know it's weird and supernatural, but just, just hold that in your mind for a second, that all these sources are saying that the androgynous beings were, were our first state. And I'll say even the Australian Aboriginals have androgynous creative gods, and every culture across the world does. Um, so you, you, ha- you have that occurring. And then you have um, Quetzalcoatl at La Venta with a man bag in the Olmec territory um, in, in Mexico, right? So he has a man bag. He is known to be an androgynous demigod, just like Viracocha. Then you have Oranis, the fish god in Samaria. He has the crazy man bag, and he's like half a fish, half a human. He gives, he brings all the arts of civilization, geometry, everything else, and you, we all know about the Sumerian mathematics, how advanced they were in the city planning, and he is also androgynous. And, he, and then you find this theme everywhere. These androgynous beings, these high spiritual beings, are carrying man bags and delivering knowledge after the flood. It's like everything you would expect from a world where there was a cataclysm and survivors restarted civilization all around the world is what you get. It's, it's stunningly obvious what has gone on here. And that's why, you know, I'm so adamant about this and, you know, people are going to be like, eh, that guy's out of his mind or whatever, or like, Oh, show me the 40,000 year old city and I'll believe it. And that's fine. But I'd like to encourage your listeners not to uh, turn away from this kind of inquiry. I, I you know, In my mind, I bet my soul to a nickel, the version of history that we're talking about is more accurate and will be accepted uh, much more 50 years from now than the current paradigm. No, you're absolutely 100% correct. I I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Now, there's uh, another part of this that, I mean, as as all of this is coming together, uh, because we have all of these multiple sources, different civilizations from around the world, all all saying the same thing. So ultimately, we're going to be proven right. I don't know if it's going to come out of Antarctica. I don't know if it's going to come out of uh, the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. 
uh, the Emerald Tablets of Toth are, are going to be, you know, on CNN. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I do believe that we're going to be proven uh, correct. Um, now, uh, and, and to that end, when it comes to uh, Edgar Casey's version of things and, and connecting to the Great Sphinx and connecting to uh, Thoth and, and Lemuria and, and Atlantis, um, what do you think is is ultimately going to show? Is this going to be the Herodotus, uh, Plato version of high technology and humans? Or are we talking about gods and 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 something else uh, more along the lines of, of Thoth um, uh, coming to Egypt? I mean, I, I don't think we can have it both ways here. Um. I, I think what's going to be revealed is, is um, an extraterrestrial connection um, to the ancient creation of Homo sapiens. Now, that's something I've always shied away with. I shied away from. I've actually, you know, I started like I am a skeptic. It might not sound it at all, but actually, I, I am a skeptic in the true sense of the world word, not a pseudo skeptic like we have an abundance of, you know, just like glorified trolls. Um, but I become more convinced intuitively as the evidence just piles up, um, that there is an extraterrestrial, uh, connection to the creation of human, uh, safe, uh, almost sapiens. I really feel like it just went through and all these different, uh, documents and sources are, are basically saying the same thing. And I think we're going to find some of that where we have, um, you know, it, all the all this time we've been calling the gods the gods, but they're not like a omniscient being. They are just advanced, you know. It's it's uh, advanced beings that we're talking about, you know. The supernatural, the extraterrestrial, you know. It, it, it's uh, I have to after all these years, I, I have to acquiesce and say that that's what I firmly like believe at this point, and I can't run from it because I want. You know, oh, I just want to talk about carbon dates and ancient sites so we get some more fake credibility. I just have to go with my gut and not give a rat's ass about, you know, what what I'm saying. You know, what my intuition tells me because that's like my main thing is that I don't just take information that, that suits my, my theory if I even happen to have one. And I dismiss something that doesn't. I take it all in and I try to sift through it as objectively as possible. And I debunk things, and you know, I debunk things in my books and in my lectures, and I've, uh, you know, I think made strong cases for very controversial subjects. But I think we're going to see a revealing of of this lost world described the way I think all these sources are describing it, with androgynous beings and high technology. You know, if you want to segue into a discussion of ancient stonework, that's one of my areas of. of uh, Curiosity in, in uh, you know, Soxy Wan and Puma Punko, the Assyrian in Egypt, and, and some of the incredible stonework you see that I, I can never be convinced that somebody could do that with the tools of the time. You know, no, some of the it, stuff I've seen that all, you know, impossible. Old Imp- combo, yeah. yeah, and, and we're, we'll do that at the top of the hour. Uh, Jim, I just want to make yep. you aware again uh, stay on your phone. Stay on your phone. Um, I, I know with a long yep. interview, it's easy to just kind of stray away from it, but uh, stay with me. Um, it, what was it that uh, caused you to go away from an alien uh, intervention or hypothesis to actually going stronger in that direction? What was the evidence that pushed you that way? I think it was the continued reading of ancient texts. Of, of Akkadian and Sumerian translations, uh, and even Casey, Edgar Casey, once again, he makes several references to, to um, uh, extraterrestrial uh, intervention. He talks about uh, the Ezekiel uh, passage in the Bible being of an extraterrestrial fashion. He, he, he like he's talking about one event and he's tying it to like the same that happened in Ezekiel, you know, so it really, uh, it just sparked something in me where I really started to give it a fair shake because in me, it was just like, I get my hands full talking about, you know, Atlantis or ancient archeology span or whatever. 
I can't even get into this realm. But honestly, the more I investigated all traditions and sat it down with wisdom keepers and shamans and read um, all these different accounts, you know, I just can't get away from it. I really feel like it's just screaming the same story all around the world. And it's not a story that is just like, oh, I really contorted this to fit my opinion of the past. It's just, uh, it seems glaringly obvious it, it is a reality. Now, last year, uh, in 2017, there was a lot of talk, uh, which continues now, but last year really got heated about Antarctica and the possibility of Antarctica being Atlantis and continental shift, you know, Charles Hapgood and, and, you know, that, that, that was a tropical area at one point. Well, the ice is melting down there, right? And we're going to find out what is underneath that ice, uh, what do you think about leaning in that direction? Is there ev- any evidence to support this? Um, yeah, I really haven't um, seen any firm evidence that I can grasp. I, I see, I've seen a lot of um, images of what are purported to be pyramids, and uh, they certainly look like natural uh, geological features to me. I haven't traveled there, I will say that. So I can't, you know, fully speak, you know, on the ground, but I haven't seen anything, but I've heard a lot of interesting um, anecdotal evidence that something's going on there. I will say it's a continent that's been buried in ice for quite a while. And if you believe the Perry Reese maps and other maps, maybe not that long ago, that there were detailed maps of this area. And yeah, I think that there's, you know, once again, I'll draw an analogy. If, uh, if your listeners are familiar with uh, David Talbot, Emmanuel Velikovsky, and the um, Electric Universe Theory, you look at Mars, and really it is like, you know, like plasma storms are the reason uh, for all the, um, the discharge and the displacement of, of, of sand there. There is a different explanation other than what you all just think. And it's not science fiction. It's just like, you know, celestial phenomena that cause, um, you know, these kind of plasma discharges or this displacement of sand. But it's this completely different uh, thought about the past. And what's happened geologically on the Earth, I think, is a, is a lot more catastrophic and, and maybe um, hard to grasp for the, the gradualists. I think we, we are seeing now that things happen rapidly and, and uh you know, like uh, magnetic shifts and pole shifts and, and continents being lost. And I know it's pounded into our head, this slow change that it's like, don't worry, you know, we got to we gotta hold on the past and we know how things go. And it's like, you know, it's out of our hands. And the past is very changeable and strange and uh, it holds a lot of mystery. It is not what we think. And I, I think uh, geologically that, that's what's going on too. Well, we have uh, uh, some scientific side of things, like it takes 2,000 years of constant, steady observation of the stars to even know about the precession of the equinox. And here we are, we're in 2018 right now. So there's 2,000 years right there. And to go through the the constellations and, and what is actually going on up there, Somebody had that knowledge because the Sumerians, uh, Egyptians, even ancient Greece, right? They knew about this. That knowledge came from somewhere. It didn't come from observing the heavens. It just couldn't. That, that's another great point is that uh, there's, a, there's a book called Hamlet's Mill about the procession of the equinox. And that, that's like um, the earth has this wobble and the Basically, the ancients understood that there was a 26,200-year cycle, um, the uh, path of the ecliptic, where, well, I don't need to get into science of it. It's basically a very precise and specific measurement that takes, as you said, an extremely long time to get. Now, in uh, Santilla and Deschend, these two, um, um, one was worked at MIT, actually. The, these two professors got together and wrote Hamlet's Mill, And basically what they found is that this idea of the procession of equinox, the specific numbers are embedded in myth and legend all around the world, which is utterly fascinating. You know, the halls of Valhalla, you know, 
uh, if you've studied Graham Hancock stuff, you certainly know like, you know, 432,000 shows up all the time. All these processional numbers are embedded in worldwide myth and, and legend, which is stunning. So basically, once again, they it got laughed out of the room, although these are great academics, you know, by skeptics, because their conclusion was that there was an ancient mother culture of, you know, unimagined sophistication that spread this incredible astronomical knowledge all around the world. And once again, like a million different other things we're talking about, it fits it the narrative that there was an advanced civilization. It got, you know, jacked up by a flood and the survivors repromulgated civilization. You know, I know I'm like, I'm always like talking my head off or whatever. I, I guess I feel like there is so much <laughs> evidence for what we're talking about. I'm, I'm trying to do it justice to get it all out there which I got to stop because I'm going to have a nervous breakdown if I <laughs> keep trying to go. Right. But I just want to convey to your audience how much freaking evidence there is from every angle and all these different academics keep drawing the same conclusions in their own uh, specialized corner of the universe. And, and they don't really get all pieced together. You know, uh, I, I, I have so many academic journals that support what I'm talking about, but these people are doing in isolation because there is no like, um, you know, um, open to a policy about these things. They kind of draw these kind of shrug your shoulders conclusions and move on to something else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And well, you know what they wrote about in Hamlet's mill, uh, that, that freaked everybody out is they say that, uh, I'm going back on my memory here, but, um, uh, you know, around 4,000, 5,000 BC that everybody knew about it. Right, <laughs> that's and it, it just it 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 was presented in a way uh, that uh, in an academic fashion, but it was not acceptable. I mean, presenting something like that that we understood at five thousand BC, uh, uh, the precession of the equinox and and uh, the zodiac and the placement of thing and the timing and the degrees of everything that went through in these cycles of time. That it wasn't just one civilization, but this was like accepted uh, uh, scientific knowledge at, at 5000 BC. And that uh, quite simply goes against the grain of everything that is being taught. Absolutely. What, what makes more sense that over a long, long time, this, this advanced civilization, you know, they came to understand all these concepts of geometry, mathematics, engineering. They, they basically built a, a highly advanced society and then destroyed themselves in a similar fashion as our society is doing right now. And then they spread this knowledge everywhere. Or just overnight you had like, you know, Gobekli Tepe pop up. This is 50 times bigger than Stonehenge and extremely sophisticated. And all these hunter-gatherer peoples that live for thousands and thousands of years basically, you know, put down that lifestyle and, and, you know, work together to, like, create this thing. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. The sophistication of the Sumerian geometry and mathematics, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, Plimpton 322 was just deciphered. It's a cuneiform tablet. After 100 years, they finally broke the code, and it's a new form of trigonometry that's absolutely stunning, you know? And that's the kind of stuff that got passed down by these shining ones, these flood survivors. And we're supposed to believe this incredible sophistication independently popped up all around the world in these isolated places. And not just the sophisticated geometry and mathematics, but the incredible building techniques. Everybody has man, you know, fish men with man bags and seven headed serpent people all around the world, you know, like with man bags and fish scales. It's like, you know, it's like an acid trip. You, you're trying to tell me this was all like some coincidence. It's not the hundredth monkey. It is so, you know, that's what I try to, you know, that's why my PowerPoints are like 500 images. I, I just really try to assert how absurd it is to believe this is like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. There's yeah. so much evidence, <laughs> if that makes sense. And when we come back, let's talk about some uh, megalithic structures and, and building techniques. But you're absolutely right. Uh, when it comes to uh, Mesopotamia, and certainly ancient Egypt too as well, but roads, libraries, books, music, laws, uh, mathematics, engineering, uh, schools. How about schools? How about libraries? All just mm -hmm. overnight, you went from forging seeds in the desert to uh, 
knowing what a library was or a core system and laws, and you were able to have a language and write it down too. It just doesn't work that way, Jim. It just doesn't. <laughs> well, let's talk about some megalithic structures and building techniques when we come back. My favorite subject. More with Jim Vieira after this short break. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER, stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation, and angioprim is the result. A safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio. A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M. Angioprim.com slash radio or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on the smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com Hello, Fader Knots. This is Jimmy Church, and I'm introducing New Pharma, a company whose products are based on science. Human function based on the endocannabinoid system, or ECS. New Pharma firmly believes in this science, and their research indicates that support of the ECS provides the beneficial effects for a healthy lifestyle. New Pharma's science includes relief capsules for pain relief, sleep capsules, which are natural support for occasional sleeplessness, foundation is support for your ECS, and fit capsules support your active lifestyle. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2B for a 33% discount on all of their products. Or visit NewPharma.com for all of the knowledge on the science. That's G-N-U-Pharma.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, our guest tonight, Jim Vieira. Tomorrow night, David Icke is here. Wednesday night, Ed Nightingale. Thursday night, John Rappaport. Friday, I'm over at Coast. 
with Matthew Ryan. And Saturday night, I'm over at uh, Coast to Coast with Emery Smith. It's a nonstop uh, for the next seven days. But tonight, our guest is uh, Jim Vieira. Now, Jim, when it comes to megalithic structures, we all know about Egypt, and we could spend six hours talking about that. But for me, if I really want to flip out, I just Google search uh, Stonewalls Peru, and I just look at images for like five hours. It's mind blowing. And when you go, you know, you go to Cusco and you're looking at these walls. Oh, what goes through your mind? Uh, that's a great point. I, I, I just, um, I see like an almost magical technology that that's at work. It, it is, uh, like aesthetically beautiful and so pleasing and so um, accomplished from being a stonemason. Uh, I'm just like stunned. I went on a tour with uh, all the, to all the sites with Brian Forrester and Hugh Newman and uh, Brian has some really uh, interesting research there and he makes some great points. Uh, You know, like he has photographs where um, an earthquake showed that uh, there was a megalithic wall, you know, built behind an Inca wall and, you know, he displays over and over again that there were different levels of of, uh, of stonework here that took place at different times. And, you know, to set the stage for the Peruvian stonework, I'll, I'll just I'll tell the story of Vera Cocha. He is the god who showed up after the Great Flood. He's usually uh, described as, as uh, tall and bearded, although he is known as androgynous once again. If you Google Vera Cocha androgyny, you, you will get this understanding that he was an androgynous god. Uh, which is, I know it's strange, but he's also uh, holding the two staffs in his hand, the God Self icon that my friend Richard Casalo has written about. Another thing, icon that, that exists all around the world, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, the God Self icon is another thing to, to look into. So Veracocha shows up in Lake Titicaca thousands and thousands of years ago after the Great Flood. He comes in on, a, on this, this mysterious metal craft, a raft of serpents, and he is called the foam of the sea because he's like generating a wake as he goes because he's, you know, the thought is that it's some kind of advanced craft that he's showing up in. And uh, just like Cuckoo Kane showed up after, uh, he's the great Irish hero of the Ulster cycle. And he was called the foam of the sea who showed up after the great flood in Ireland. And he had seven fingers and seven toes. If you Google Cuckoo Lane, the hair of the Ulster cycle, you will find in Wikipedia that he is described with seven fingers and seven toes. So anyways, the same androgynous creator guy shows up like Lexicono and, you know, so many others, and he brings the arts and civilization. In case he says in Peru, there are Atlantean colonies. And he talks about the walls of Peru and how they were built. And he says they use sound and light and levitation, a spiritual technology to cut and transport those stones. So then you get to a place like there, there are so many examples of it. It's Fusco, Saxi One, and Olite Tambo. You get a place like Olite Tambo, and the quarry is like over a mountain. And, you know, you have to, it just makes your head hurt to, you know, to think of, of cutting and transporting the stones. And the stones are so tight at all these places. It's not that you can't get a razor blade in between them, you can't get a micron in between these stones and they are all like joined in a way that they're, it's not just the front that's joined, they're curved. So the entire twist and turn behind the stone is all interlocking in a fascinating like way. And as a stonemason, once again, I, I don't know what to say. You know what it is? I'll give an, an analogy. When shock and Anthony West uh, clearly indicated that, the weathering of the Sphinx indicated a, a date of like 8,000 or 10,000 years ago because that weathering, that water weathering is geology 101, right? It's incontrovertible. Right. But because the arrogance and, and the closed minded of Egyptologists, you know, geologists uh, routinely agree that it, that's weather watering. But, you know, Zali Hawass and Werner and the rest of the crew, it's like, you're not going to interrupt on my field and tell me. And, you know, I could go down a long winded road there, but I'll just say that the, the, the stonework is is utterly impossible to pull off the way it was supposed to be pulled off at Pumapunku, 
at Sexy Woman at Oli Tombo. It is it is just like so stunning when you're at the Corey Concha or in Cusco Center. I, I can't even tell you how tight these fits are. It's it's like there has to be some mind boggling technology that we don't understand that we use to do it. It's not a matter of time and labor. It's a matter of technology and in, in the the way that these things were cut. That's what I have to say. And I've never been proven wrong in that, you know, and I, in fact, you know, I'm conjuring a new show uh, and writing an outline. And one of the things I want to do is have master masons use the stone of the time and try to recreate some of those blocks. And I couldn't do it. Uh, I, I would be stunned if, if somebody could pull it off. It was easy. No matter what, no, you know, that's the thing. It was easy for them, and we need to. Uh, uh, they they did it because it was easy. Easy, Jim. They had that, that's they had a way that. of doing it. They when you look at, and especially when you're at uh, when you're at Cusco or 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 any of these places, and you look at the walls, and you look at the size, and you look at the cuts. Okay, all right, impressive. But the stones also came from a quarry. 25, 30, 40, 50 miles away over hills and mountains. And now you got now you have to sit and 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 postulate how they got them there. That it was easy for them. It it, it wasn't difficult. It had to have been an easy process. That, that that's a great point and it, it probably took me more energy trying to describe um you know, <laughs> how awe-inspiring the stonework is than for them to actually do it. And Dave, my buddy David Hatchett Childress, he he makes that point a lot. He just says, this was easy for them. And it sounds like a simplistic explanation, but it isn't. It, it is exactly what you're talking about. They, it has all the earmarks of that. It is, like, done for the uh, artistic beauty and the ability to earthquake-proof it. And um, it, it is clear the way you just don't choose blocks that are that huge. And even like the Assyrian in Egypt, you know, you don't choose 200 ton red granite blocks and like join them together like that because, you know, you just like, you'd slice them down. You do it a different way unless it was easy. And that, that is the, it's the most obvious and simplest explanation. I think that, and it, it's just not too hard to fathom. We, we are told that there was advanced technologies in the past that there were beings with spiritual abilities we don't yet understand, uh, but it's coming down the pipe. You know, we're going to have, like, changes in the perception of, of uh, the nature of reality, about the the, the uh, capabilities of different species, even the capabilities of our own species that have been late for a long time because we've fallen into a, a three-dimensional coma here the last 10,000 years. So, uh, you know, just sit back and don't worry about the skeptics. They, they can, you know... Go shit in their hat, as my mother used to say, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And you're a stonemason, and when you put together one of these walls where, you know, nothing is symmetrical, right? Everything is an individual cut. As a stonemason, if you built it in conventional terms with what you understand today, you're placing this stone up there, you know, a 200-ton rock, and it doesn't fit. You pull it down. You shape it. You put it back. It doesn't fit. You pull it down. You shape it. And you put it back. That's what you do, right? Well, you wouldn't do that with a two with with a wall of two hundred ton stones. That would be impossible. It would take you thousands of years to build the wall. You just couldn't do it. Uh, it's another great point. And archaeologists don't have to worry about the problem. They can just say, well, you know, we have. Um carbon dated evidence that show that some people were here in 200 BC and that's probably when it was built. And, uh, let's forget about all the layers of sediment that really appear to, uh, indicate a cataclysm happened here. Like at Pumapunku, we basically, uh, just going off of the carbon dates we can ascertain. And, and when you're in Oli Tintambo, this isn't like one block that's square. You're talking about the lifting and putting down of, of these multi-sided, twisting and turning, interlocking, fitting stones that are exquisitely fit together in every plane. And they cut and transport. It just makes my freaking head hurt, you know what I mean, to, to like do that. This summer, my brother and I worked with a buddy of mine who builds natural pools, and we built a pool out of granite. 
and we got diamond saws and, and I can't tell you how hard that stone is, how absurd it is to work. And, you know, we got it fake close, but not even, not, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it was nice for what it is, but the idea that the, the transportation and the polishing and the fitting of, of these stones, uh, let alone taking from the quarry was, you know, just done by time and effort. I, I will never believe it, and it's never going to be proven. And what the antithesis of that argument will be proven at some point by finding some megalithic temple under Lake Titicaca that's like 20,000 years old or something. Yeah, I know. And when you look at these multi-sided stones, and we, we some are multi-sided, some are crazily sided too as well, right? And yeah. if, if, you, yeah. if we were doing this by conventional means like we understand today, and you were trying to tell a stonemason back then, you know what? No, not square. I need 47 sides, right? <laughs> You'd have a revolution on you. You'd have a mutiny on your yeah. hands. Yeah. There was something easy going on. Now, let me ask you this. What about, and I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I know it sounds kind of uh, juvenile, but what about maybe these things were just soft, <laughs> Right. Maybe, you know, like you take clay, you know, you take a bunch of clay balls and you just put them together in your hand and you just mash them together. And now you've got, you know, everything is, could it have been oh. something like that? that? That's not juvenile at all. That's exactly what it looks like at Soxy Bombing. It looks like these, these, so many of these sites look like the stone was melted and molded and put together that way. That makes more sense than a lot of the theories. Uh, Percy Fawcett, who was looking for the lost city of Z, he actually talked about um, there were birds who would take this plant and they would like uh, melt stone. They would like it had this property of melting stone when you put the plant down on rock to make nests. <clears throat> and I think he was um, he was talking about uh, that was possibly how some of this ancient stonework was done. I think that's kind of a rudimentary thing. I think we're talking more about a Edgar Casey, Atlantean, you know, and there you go again, you know, Casey's talking about Atlantean colonies and he's talking about the walls across Peru. He's talking specifically about how these ancient constructions were done. And right. This, this dude with an eighth grade education is going to a freaking trans state. He probably doesn't know anything about the history of Peru. He knows nothing about geology, anthropology, archeology, span and even less about Atlantis. All he does is like read the Bible and be nice to people. You know, he's just like a, just a really nice guy. And he is talking about these colonies and the with stonework that's uh, outrageously uh, constructed. Lo and behold, you have all these constructions in Peru, right? It's not just like, wow, there's some nice stonework there. Some of the most stunning stonework on the planet is right where Casey said the Atlanteans had colonies. And then the dude who shows up from Atlantis is like, you know, this bearded freak with like, you know, who's androgynous, driving some, you know, metal craft or whatever, who, who teaches all these people, you know, like the arts of civilization and outlaws cannibalism, just like <clears throat> Thoth did in Egypt, which sounds absurd, like 10, 12,000 years ago, the, these people are so whacked out, the indigenous people, that they were cannibalizing each other. But that was one of the, the laws that was passed on both sides of the Atlantic. And then we all know the story that pyramids and, ancient, you know, amazing stonework and Mass and it was all generated um, seemingly independently on both sides of the Atlantic, and I don't think either of us believe that that was really true. It is so obvious and intuitively, like you know, I know your audience has an open mind, but what does your gut tell you? You know, when you review all this information, is it like, yeah, those guys, you know, they're interesting, but they're really not onto something, or like, wow, this view of history answers all these strange questions of myth and legend and the Titans, and the Lost World. You, you, you think the, the Greeks and the Romans didn't know what the hell they were talking about? You know, like, oh, that's silly mythology. No, they have human characteristics because they're advanced human beings that are just screwed up as our society, too, right? right. So the gods are doing whacked-out things that we wouldn't ascribe to a real god, but to advanced beings in a world in a Gigia or Og, as Casey said, you know, home is a Gigia, Atlantis, then... You know, with that makes sense. Well, when you look at, see, this is this is what is fascinating to me. Why, uh, when we're talking about uh, Orthodox academia, just with the blinders on, 
But you look at Egypt, you look at Peru, you look at, uh, you know, not only uh, South, but Central America, you look uh, into Asia, you're seeing the same type of stonework being done. Now, either each one of these civilizations separated by large bodies of water um, had something in their DNA that uh, forced them into coming up with the same solutions independently of each other, or there was somebody that was teaching everybody the very same things. And I'm sorry, it's a lot more easier to understand and grasp that they just had a source. They had a teacher. There was a master race. There was somebody out there getting this done for everybody. To think that all of these cultures did it independently of themselves stonework that is shockingly identical and they had the same solutions of moving these huge hundred ton 200 ton thousand ton blocks and carving and quarrying them i, I it's uh it's like occam's razor uh, personified absolutely and on top of that the beings who they specifically talk about showing up all embody the same characteristics they're all shown you know, with the God self icon or with a man bag or a hybrid or androgynous six fingers and six toes, they bring the uh, written language, mummification, the same spiritual beliefs. See, we're looking at a lens, you know, you would think you would have this, this, these cultures that emerge independently. Um, you would think that there'd be these like, um, uh, strange proclivities they have like oh this play these guys are master stonemasons they did incredible work and these guys built terraces and were just farmers and these people weren't sophisticated at all even though they were isolated it's like no everybody is embodying like the same uh general ideas of civilization understanding of procession and astronomy animal husbandry you know like all these different arts of civilization that you find at corral you find in Mesopotamia, like you said. And once again, what makes more sense, a long developed over like 150, 200,000 year advanced civilization that bit the dust and spread its wisdom and jump started in places like Gobekli Tepe and Peru once again, or they independently all came up with these same ideas all at the same time. It just doesn't make sense. And in, in the realms of stonework and engineering, you're talking about a, an incredible running curve. This isn't just like, oh, you know, we built that shitty pyramid and this one's better and that. The stonework you see on the planet is, uh, I'm running out of like superlatives and adjectives to describe some of it. It is, it's like a sci-fi movie. And we're just like going around in a coma looking at these astonishing testimonials to a lost world pretending that humans did it, you know, 1,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago. What, what's your uh, best guess now that we've started to really get this evidence put together? Uh, when you look at the Great Pyramid uh, and the dating of it, is this, are we way off track here? Are we back into maybe a Thoth uh, origins on this that possibly the, I mean, what's your guess? Is it, is it was it built in twenty six fifty BC or ten thousand BC fifty thousand BC? Uh, yeah, if I if I like um, was hooked up to the lie detector test, I would say there's twenty seven fifty BC is the conventional Orthodox Zali Hawa state, and then there is Casey who said between ten thousand four hundred and ten thousand three hundred BC, Atlantean survivors led by Thoth and Hermes, I mean, um, and Rata. Now, Thoth, Casey said, was one of the incarnations of Jesus, and they had many together. And Rata was the architect of the Grand Pyramid, who was one of Casey's incarnations in, in a previous life, which is absolutely fascinating. So anyways, you have these androgynous weirdos showing up like 11,000 years ago, and they built the Great Pyramid. And at that time, I believe, and that's what Casey says specifically, the Great Pyramid Complex... You know, we, we know the whole Howard Vice story and the, you know, there's not a lot of strong evidence at all that it was, that it's that um, young, if you will. Yeah, there's speak up, yeah, Jim, you need yeah. to speak up. You need to speak up. Oh, well, I'm sorry. 
uh, there's not a lot of evidence that it's that ancient. I mean, that it's that young. And the Sphinx looks like it's a lot older. And the Assyrian looks like it's a lot older. And <clears throat> I, I tend to believe that version of events. And maybe this new void that was found will reveal something that, that gives evidence that it's much older than we think. I think there's going to be a discovery in Egypt that's going <clears> to, <throat> you know, enlighten us to, to the real um, mysteries there. But I, I would uh, <clears throat> tend to believe that Casey was more accurate than current Egyptologists. I see fascinating levels of sophistication and understanding embedded into the Great Pyramid that are uh, just just unbelievable. Like uh, the the, uh, the numbers that are embedded in there, like the speed of light and the circumference of the Earth, and it, it is an Atlantean creation in my mind. I want to thank you for coming on tonight, and I I, I cannot uh, uh, wait for you to get out here uh, to the West Coast for Contact in the Desert and hanging out with all of us and presenting all of this information. Jim, you're one of the best, and uh, give my best to Hugh, and of course, we'll see the two of you, I can't even believe I'm going to say this, in two short months, you're going to be out here. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah, thank Contact in the Desert for having me, and please uh, go along there and check it out if you're not going already, because uh, it's a cool event, and thank you once again. I really... Uh, I always like doing interviews because you, you just ask the best questions. You have a real like knack for um, being prophetic and, and leading the guests. So I, I really appreciate your uh, competency and your, uh, your style. I, uh, I really uh, admire you. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Jim. And it goes right back to you. Uh, the admiration uh, is definitely on a two-way street here. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in uh, two short months. Thank you so much, Jim. Behave and be well. All right, brother. Take care. Jim Vieira, everybody, that was just an amazing conversation. And like I said, Contact in the Desert, June 1st through the 4th out here in uh, Los Angeles, actually in Palm Springs, Indian Wells, California. This is Fade to Black. All of Jim's links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. I'll open up the phones and we'll go to open lines right after this. Stay with us. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. So you went to dinner last night, you had your favorite pasta. Ugh. Or maybe you had a heavy, spicy meal and it left you. Ugh. Get the tea.com. Maybe you mowed down a huge steak and your plumbing is all plugged. Ugh. Get the tea.com. Our super strength tea will take care of your occasional. Ugh. It's all organic and non GMO. Get rid of. Ugh. We have so many great supplements, but our super tea is number one. Get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker.
Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hey, can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger... You know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. The holidays are coming. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more in order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Jim Vieira. Incredible, incredible conversation. It's going down. I'm telling you, there is so much uh, when it comes to not only Atlantis and Lemuria, but when we look at uh, the megalithic structures from around the world and where they got the information and the technology to go and do this. Uh, I'm opening up the phone lines right now, 323-825-5045 or 323-275-9695. Yes, open lines right now. And uh, and what what I find uh, really most interesting uh, with this conversation, um, and it's the way that I started this, this off earlier tonight, is that Rita and I do a large amount of research, and I can't I can't express that that part of this enough. Uh, this this show just doesn't happen each day. We research and we research, and with the amount of uh, literature and books that we get uh, sent to us from from authors around the world, we have that. We have uh, where our research leads us. And we have uh, spent so much time over the years on not only um, uh, Egypt and and Thoth and 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 Lemuria and Atlantis and uh, 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 all. I mean, when it when it comes to Plato or Herodotus and and Egypt and uh, ancient Sumer. It's it's amazing to us, but the other part, and if you're on hold, stay right there. I'll get to you in just a second. The amazing part is when you collectively look at the the evidence that we have today, um, we have all of the alternative researchers out there. We have that, but it's also just what's in textbooks and what is out there. And you look at the, the, the photographs and you look at the images and you're just like, there is one source there's one source of this uh, this this technology, this education that is handed down. It's the only thing that makes sense. It really, it really does. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? You're live. Hello? Yes, you're live. Hi, yeah, this is Jared. Hey, Jared, how are you? I'm doing good. I live in Albuquerque. You live in Albuquerque. Did you? What'd you yeah. think? What'd you think about this uh, conversation tonight? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I think it's really fascinating. Um, I think it's crazy all the stuff about Facebook. You know. 
Ah, you want to go there. Okay, did you download uh, your data files on Facebook? I haven't yet. I'm kind of scared to, honestly. <laughs> I know there, there was a long, uh, it was several months ago um, that issue came up. You know, for the longest time, I've always thought that, you know, um, Facebook and, and everybody is, you know, ha- has all my data and everything. And I've always thought, well, you know, they've, they've got all my data, yeah, but I've really got nothing to hide. But then w- when this information came out recently, uh, it's, I realized how much data they actually have. And it's like, wow, some of that stuff, that's, that's a little spooky, man. There's, there's, there's stuff that I don't want them to have. And w- the scary part about it is not only do they have that data, but who's getting that data? And this thing with with uh, Cambridge Analytics comes around, and it's like, you know, anybody with you know the highest bidder can get all that data from you. And then what do they do with it? You know, it was crazy when you were talking earlier about, um, you know, contacts that weren't even in your phone of celebrities and other people showed up in your download, and it's like. What are they doing with all that information, and who's doing what with it? It's pretty scary. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know where the information comes from, and when you think about it, um, uh, and what I mean by that is, if it's not in my phone, right? And I know that I have a Facebook app in my phone, and I know that what is probably stored in my phone isn't safe, right? So Mm -hmm. is it that Facebook is collecting the data off of my phone and then uh, transferring that uh, to their data harvesting and and collections? That's a pretty frightening thought. But then I think it's even darker than that if you think about it. So um, with uh, emails, names, mentions, and so forth, that some of these names that aren't... Uh, in my contacts in my phone versus who are my friends on my friends list. Okay, that's one thing. But then you take it a step further out. So they take a name and somewhere out there on the internet is somebody else's private information. So they gather that phone number and they tie it with something that is in my phone or emails or something. And then it all gets lumped into a file folder in my Facebook data, and that's that. That to me is pretty creepy, and this is yeah. and this is the other part. This is uh, this is something that's really funky. Now let's suppose there is a phone number and a name that is now in this contacts folder on on Facebook, the data file, right? And mm-hmm. you have um, uh, uh, somebody that you don't know but is connected to you through Facebook, but you don't know about it, right? And this person commits a crime. You don't know this person, Ooh, right? right? You don't know this person. You've never called yeah. him. He doesn't, you don't know his name, nothing, or she. And then they do, uh, uh, they get the data files on him through Facebook, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they subpoena the, the files. And they go and they get them. And then in his contacts list is your phone number. But you don't know oh, this guy, right? right? And now yeah, uh, they're investigating this guy, and you get a phone call. Maybe you get a knock at the door. What do you know about this guy? You're connected. To, no, I'm not. Yeah, you are, because he's got mm-hmm. your phone number. And you're like, wait, mm-hmm. wait, I have no idea what you're talking about. But now... You're guilty of something through association, and yeah, that's yeah. that's what I'm. It very well could be that they're getting the phone numbers from people in your friends list. So it's not something that was in your phone, but it's something that was in their phone, right? But that's, why it shows up in your download, I don't know. Exactly. And so I invite everybody. I invite everybody that is on Facebook. Go. All you have to do. It's this simple. You go to settings, right? Right here. You do the drop down menu settings. The first thing that lights up is general. And right there, download a copy of your Facebook data. It's right there. You don't have to search for it. 
That's it. Yeah. It's, I invite yeah. everybody to go and do it. And you may not like what you see, but what you do need to know is what Facebook has collected on you. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Well, it's funny when they, when they, they talk about the AI and everything, Elon Musk talks about that a lot. Zuckerberg has talked that, about that a lot. You know, it's it's been impl- implemented into Facebook at times, and they've gotten into trouble with that at, at times before. But then you look and see Elon Musk himself deleted the all the all the Facebook pages that they had on Face. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, the other thing that I br- want to bring up with the AI, AI is, is something that showed up on a um, uh, the story that showed up a few weeks ago. Was there was this guy that got these cre- it showed up on Twitter, and this guy got some really because you mentioned how you were getting some some voicemails on your on your download that mm-hmm. you couldn't you didn't really recognize and were kind of creepy. Right. Some guy got some calls from an automated uh, machine, right? And it was like machine code and, and all that, but it was saying you know like the military. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like the military alphabet. Well, they'll say like Foxtrot, Unicorn, right. and, have you, and all that. Have you listened to it? Yeah. I haven't listened to it, but I've seen a lot of the reports of like the coordinates that were um, drawn out of that and and the messages that were drawn out, like something about they're not human. Mm-hmm. And it was like, this guy's freaking out. And he's just like, I need to get a new cell phone service. I don't know what's going on. I, I listened, that was really crazy. Yeah, I listened to uh, the phone message, and uh, mm-hmm. and it's just like what you're saying. Yankee Foxtrot of, you know, Alpha Indigo, right? And so it's a long message, and uh, it's, it's, it sounds like uh, probably what would go on between, you know, what they call numbers stations, right? Where their uh, spies are giving these encoded messages and you have to go and decode them. But um, I, I, I read all of the Reddit posts and everything that was uh, everybody trying to pick these codes apart. And you're, you're right. It was uh, uh, a weird alien ET connection here. Uh, eventually, as it, it as it started to get picked apart, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, but it is a crazy. It's called the TY message, by the way. It's called the TY message, oh. and uh, yeah. yeah, anybody can go and 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 check it out. I have uh, a couple of threads, and they're long too. These threads are uh, very tedious, and how these code breakers. Uh, get this stuff broken. You know, these are very smart uh, groups of people that are able to pick this apart because I wouldn't be able to do it. And, and some of it is even in Morse code. So, oh, really? Yeah. I haven't heard that. Part yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now, okay. Yeah. So, um, back to this uh, Facebook thing, though. This is something else that is pretty fascinating. Elon Musk, for example, had uh, two million followers on Facebook. Right, his SpaceX or mm-hmm. Tesla, or whatever, uh, two different accounts that he deleted. Um, we have uh, our fade to black radio page. I think we have. I don't even know. I, I don't want to take the time to look, but I don't know ten, fifteen thousand uh, followers there, maybe more. Um, but mm. so you have all of those accounts and their data now too that are part of our Facebook page. Elon Musk, if you have 2 million followers on that page, that's 2 million points of data collection for Facebook. Right now, so now, and then you have all of those contacts and likes and how it spider webs out from there individually. So, okay, so we're talking about 2 million likes on his, okay, well, no, let's go simpler. If I have 15,000 likes on my Facebook page, on the radio page, and each one of those has 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 friends. And each one of those has, right? You see how it spider webs out? And that, yeah, it's just crazy exponential. Yes. It's, 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 it's creepy. And if you don't think mm-hmm. the NSA or Facebook or Google has the ability to go and collect all of that data, uh, you know, who is this group of people that are following Fade to Black? Well, let's check this out. You know, and 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 this is the other creepier part. 
I don't know who's following the radio show. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Right, yeah. Could yeah. be somebody working for the NSA. Could be 10. How many how many Facebook security people are friends of mine on Facebook on my friends account? I don't know. How many of there are there that are invisible that are following what I am posting on Facebook? I can assure you that there are dozens of Facebook security people that are following my Facebook page. I guarantee it. It's not an egotistical thing. It's their yeah. job. The right? chances are there, yeah. Oh, and yeah. Just statistically, it's, it's bound to happen. I have tried. I have gone and found a bunch of these Facebook security people, right? And mm-hmm. so you find them and then try to block them. They're following <laughs> me, right? And you can't <laughs> block them. You yeah, uh, now yeah. you, I can block anybody, right? Theoretically, right? right? Yeah, and then you find well, you the- know. And the other scary thing is, okay, so this this company, Cambridge Analytics, they're that a written company that managed to that created this application that harvested all kinds of data, and then they used it to try to sway the election. We don't know whether they made a good, you know, did a good job of that or not. But the point is, they were able to do that. Who's you know what other governments could you know get that information and then what could they do with that you know i mean we're in we're in the age we're living in an age of information and also cy- um cyber attacks you know cyber um warfare a lot of a lot of warfare is done through the internet there's i think there was one i used i used to work in i t for computer networking and um Cisco, which is one of the biggest manufacturers of internet um, routing com- computers and components. The majority of the world's infrastructure runs off of those that equipment. Switchers, and, yeah, switchers. Yeah, yeah, switches and routers and all that, all that kind of stuff. Right. And they they do a lot of self-diagnosing tests to see. You know, they'll test just random spots within the network hub. To see what traffic is going where and all that, and and then some of the some of the big huge backbone industries that that um, they help um, support technically, you know, they found that um, almost over ninety percent of uh, of the of the places that they audited had some kind of traffic coming in and out of it that shouldn't have been there. Um, so that tells you that the majority of of um, places that have you know big server farms and different like that, a lot of these places are being used by somebody where traffic is going in and out. They don't know where it's going to, where it's coming from, but it's not supposed to be there. It's not initiated by that company. Um, that is and, that is really creepy. Yeah, yeah, it's creepy. Yeah. And then you know with. When uh, back when um, uh, what was it that movie that came out that, was, that they tried to come out with that got in uh, Sony into a lot of trouble, and then there was the, oh the, the interview rumors. yeah the interview yeah yeah that yeah and then Sony got hacked and it's just like you think you start to think about all the different cyber warfare things that have gone on and you know if Facebook has that information there. And make a company like Cambridge Analytics can get their hands on it. That's the only one that we know of that it's happened. Yeah, what and about all the other, you know? Right, and it's the psychological side of it uh, for the data. It's not your phone number; they don't care about that. It's not your email; they don't care about that. Mm-hmm. It's the psychological side of your profile. And I cannot believe that after everything that has gone down, that Facebook still has. On on your homepage, the psychological questions for you to answer. Like right now, I just refreshed my Facebook page. Right, you know what the question is right now? Some What's that? Uh, it's it's you know uh, answer a question to help people get to know you. W- what people, by the way? It doesn't say your friends, right? It says, I think, yeah, I answer think my a friends question. on Facebook should know me well enough. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Answer a question to help people get to know you. And then this question is, some good advice for passings, uh, passing exams is... What, what, that is a psychological profiling question if there oh, ever yeah, was one. Yeah. So let me... Let well, me never, I'm going to refresh oh, go my screen, right? Okay, the next question is... 
Right now, I would love to hug. It's, wait, what is this? <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Yeah. The psychological profiling uh, Freudian dark questions. Okay, I'm going to do it one more time just for grins. Oh, here you go. Nobody beats me playing. What it was, it's just like that is a That's psychological yeah. mind trap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and all these all these quizzes was like, what kind of Pirates of the Caribbean character are you? And you do all these questions, you know. You, if you look at those questions and compare them to psychological personality profile tests, they like a lot of times they match one for one, you know. And so they have all the, that's why I always never, I never did any of those. Even be just, I always just thought they were too silly to begin with. And then when I find out that they're building a database out of it, it's like, no, I'm not going to touch the Right, right. And And I think those are the types of apps that this Cambridge Analytics got their data. That's exactly what it was. That's exactly what it was. And uh, and this is the, uh, this is the trippy part. This is the part that uh, nobody is addressing directly, not the journalist uh, back to Facebook and Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg didn't address this directly himself, but I think it is painfully obvious, and it is this. Number one, they they mined the data and sold it to companies and advertisers. That's point number one. Point number two, they uh, d- had these uh, tests psychological profiles built by third parties and sucked the information out of us, okay? And they were paid for that, too. I'm talking about Facebook. So they get paid to harvest the data and sell it. They get paid for the app developers to to come in and, and extract this information. And then Facebook then takes that data and brings it back into Facebook and profits from it again by selling advertising. So, mm-hmm. and to use that against us for advertising and the fake news platform that gets clicked on. It's like they, mm-hmm. they, they're they double and triple dipping. They're taking our data. Right. They're not paying us for the data that they're selling. They take the data, they sell it uh, two or three different times, and then it is then brought back in, and Facebook gets to charge for it after they've sold it. It's like the craziest <laughs> yep, business yep. model ever, and it's perfect. And it blows yeah, my and, mind, and, and nobody wants to talk about not, it. Yeah, and these aren't just American accounts. These are people all over the entire planet. And they don't care. A Facebook account. And yep, they don't no. care. They do Whoever not care. Whoever is the highest bidder. Whoever is the highest bidder. And I'm I'm blown away how uh, the American public and uh, uh, the legislators are almost okay with it. You know, that Mm -hmm. Facebook got so big, and then when you get that big, you are going to have people coming at you, whether it's the NSA or a private corporation, to purchase this information from you. And then you also uh, have all of this money for research and development with engineers to come back and develop AI, take this information from us, and come back and and develop these server farms for AI and ways to profitize on this data. Because the data is free. We're giving it to them, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so wonder if like the NSA, who's already monitoring a lot of the uh, traffic that's going on, you know, when they figured out how much Facebook has gathered, they're like, hey, you know, maybe we could buy some of that information from you. You guys have figured out stuff on people that you know we don't have. <laughs> you know, they're, we all we know, all we know that NSA from you know like the Snowden leaks is that they they were getting like phone call information and metadata and emails and different things like that. Um, some of the prof- psychological profiles that fa- Facebook has been able to compile over the years, they might not have had, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I can just see the NSA agents, hey, you know, calling up Facebook, hey, you would kind of need some pointers on how to build, you know. <laughs> but I don't know if that's true or not. But, you know, it's just speculation. Well, um, what I want you to do, download your data. 
Click through. It's going to be a ton of stuff, whether it's 200 megabytes, 500 megabytes, or a gigabyte. I don't know how long you've been on Facebook or what you've been surfing or anything. I don't, it, you know, that's not the point. The point is, I want you to go through those folders. Go through. Go through the HTML stuff. That's going to freak you out. And go through the content and just go and look and go, you know what? I don't know that person, and there's a phone number for him, or um, I know who that person is, but I've never called them. I, you know, <laughs> and you're going to go through, and you're going to see some pretty fascinating things there. And what are they doing with that info, and why is it with you? So there you go. Uh, Jared, great phone call, man. Um, and thank hey, you. Yeah. First-time caller, right? Yeah, yeah, first time call. I've been listening to the show for quite a while now. I got interested in, um, I found found it through Corey Good and a lot of his stuff on Guy Ed. Looking forward to hearing Emory Smith on uh, Saturday. Over a coast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, over a coast. Yeah, don't be a stranger, man. And he's, uh, All right. yeah. well, hey, uh, before I let you go, I got like one minute. Uh, you said New Mexico. Mm-hmm. How close are you to a Kirtland and uh, Sandia? Yeah, Kirtland is about like a 10, 15 minute drive where where I live. So when I whenever he started coming forward with his information, I was like, "Holy crap, that's just down the street." From it's there. right there. I know. And what's weird because from the freeway or from the airport, you can see the Kirtland sign, right? And and you mm-hmm. can see the sign, you can see the mountains in the background, you can see Sandia. And when you mm-hmm. hear all of this stuff, not only from this show and from Emory, but from others, uh, and mm-hmm. you can just look right there and see it. It's pretty creepy, isn't it? It's just like it's yeah. right there in your face. Yeah, as soon as that all started coming out, I was just like, holy shit, I'm so... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, like, it's just like, wow, I'm so close to like all of those underground bases and all that other stuff. It's just amazing. It's right there. Well, thank you, Jared. Yeah. Be safe and be well, my friend. Don't be a stranger. You too, you too. All right, yeah, have a good night. You too. Great phone call. So good, I ignored all the other phone calls. And that's what... uh, One thing, before I get out of here, I want everybody to understand. It's not, uh, for me, it's not taking one phone call after another. If one phone call is great like that one, I will just... I will not cut it short. That was a great phone call. Thank you, Jared, uh, right there in New Mexico. So, again, I want to drive this home. All you have to do is go to Facebook, go to your menu right there, settings. I'm doing it right here in real time. Click on that. It's automatically on the general tab. You're going to go to that page, and it's going to say download a copy of your Facebook data. Don't be scared. You need to know. All of this talk, everything that I have said, and others, and all of the reports about this being in the media, and Cambridge Analytica, and what has actually gone on here, you want a taste of reality? Now, look, I understand you've been posting on Facebook, and you've been letting it hang out on Twitter, and your world is all exposed. Well, you know what? Showing pictures of your dog and your cat and your niece's birthday party, that's all one thing, all right? Go and click on this, and you will see a world of information that not only uh, that you don't remember, but stuff that apparently has nothing to do with you. Go look at the list of companies that Facebook has sold your information to. It's all right there, and they say it. (laughs) Companies that have your information. Go and click on it. It is absolutely fascinating, and it's your information it's your data. You need to know what is out there, and you can do it right now. It's uh, it's going to be a really, really dark couple of months coming up for Facebook. I can assure you of that. I want to thank Jim Vieira for coming in tonight. Absolutely fascinating. Perfect conversation tonight on Fade to Black. Tomorrow night, David Icke is right here. David Icke talking about all that social media data mining. Fade to Black's executive producers, Rita Camarion. Shows produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster, Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast zone and copyrighted 2018 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe 
without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. Until tomorrow night, David Icke right here. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Until tomorrow night, be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy. Yeah.